Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to get started this morning. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Lisa Bediaco. I'm with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I oversee their Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative, and we'll hear a little bit about that um, a little later. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second annual uh, International Conference on Stigma here at Howard University. Uh, we have an important and informative conference about HIV stigma plan today. We will discuss what stigma is, what stigma looks like, its impact, best practices, and at addressing and best practices at addressing stigma. We have guests joining us from all over the world, uh, including Puerto Rico, Peru, Mexico, Uganda, South Africa, to name a few. I want to say hello to everyone out there looking at us on the web. Uh, you can join us at whocanyoutell.org. Uh, especially if you're tweeting, please tweet those in the audience. Um, we could be followed at who can you tell org and it's spelled out there are no little shortcuts it's w h u o u t e l l um, i hope i spelled that right i think i spelled i forgot uh, a word oh the word can who can you tell um, again please use the hashtag who can you tell if you are tweeting for those who get the social media work. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to Howard University for hosting us again on this great, um, this, on this commemorative day of World AIDS Day. Um, and to begin our welcome, please welcome to the stage Dr. Sidney Rabot, the president of Howard University. Good morning. I'm afraid to put my notes down or touch anything. There's so much technology here. I'm afraid if I lay something down and hit a button, a button I might disappear. <laughs> you might never, somewhere in the cyberspace and you might never see me again. Uh, on behalf of the Howard University uh, community, I'm uh, delighted and honored to welcome you to the second uh, international conference on uh, stigma. Uh, today at World AIDS Day is the appropriate time uh, to have this conference, but it's always the appropriate time to talk about issues of significance to our communities and the quality of our life. Uh, I too join in welcoming partners uh, who are through the web uh, participating in this. Uh, Brazil, I was told, Guatemala, India, China, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, uh, and other points that might be listening or participating in this, uh, in this program. I was recently uh, at an event and there was a gentleman there who said, I, I saw you uh, a few weeks ago. And I said, where? And he said, I saw you in China. Now, I knew I wasn't in China, uh, so I didn't know exactly what was going on, but it was an event here on campus. It was a webcast all over the world, and he happened to be in China at the time and had an opportunity to participate in that event. So what technology can do is marvelous, but something as important as uh, the topic we're talking about today, you know, stigmas and HIV, uh, it's a worldwide challenge. It's not just the Washington, D.C. challenge. It's not just the East Coast challenge. It's not just the United States challenge. So it's appropriate that we utilize our technologies to reach people throughout the world. Uh, we all know, and you'll find out more today about stigmas and what that actually means. Uh, but if you just think for a moment of your own lives and, and, and the ways in which we, we stigmatize individuals based on the color of their skin, their height, their weight, where they're born, the regional uh, you know, backgrounds from which they come. We've all been uh, considered outsiders at one time or another. But just imagine for a moment the, the stigma that's carried by uh, folks who have uh, HIV. Uh, I was looking at some of the posters when I was coming in. They were on display and uh, the work that they're doing to really you know, get some empirical data about how people feel what, about HIV uh, uh, and its impact on our communities, our people who have HIV, uh, what stigmas really are, what are the, the realities and the myths that still in 2011 we're dealing with regarding HIV. Uh, 30 years later, you know, uh, we're still looking at uh, a lack of awareness, 
a lack of understanding, and some misconceptions that are detrimental to us really addressing the full impact of HIV on our communities and helping us you know, solve some of the challenges, medical challenges and, and social isolations that are created by HIV. So the, the reality of stigma is real. The reality of HIV stigma is something that you'll find a lot more about today. And finally, I'd like to say on behalf of Howard University is that Howard University is about and has been since 1867 fighting for the rights of the disenfranchised in a variety of areas, in the legal community, uh, in education, in the healthcare uh, community. But Howard's legacy is inextricably tied to justice, equality, and inclusion, and enfranchisement of people. So it is very appropriate and very fitting to have this conference here. Know that uh, as you explore these issues of, of significance that you have a partner here at Howard University. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Rabeau. As Dr. Rabeau mentioned, um, there are posters around the room, and I have some notes about that. These posters were done by some young people, and uh, we also have some exhibit, um, some abstract posters that are out in the hallway, and I hope that everyone gets a chance to go around and look at them. Um, we also have exhibit tables that um, many of our partners, there are so many partners working, um, uh, worked on this conference this year. And uh, I, will, I will let Dr. Rana and Dr. Vargas talk about that. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about the, um, the posters, the fighting stigma posters uh, around the room here were done by high school students. It was a contest um, and the Howard University Hospital uh, worked together with the schools and provided them with basic background information about stigma and uh, they then went and did some uh, creative creative ways to talk about HIV stigma including the posters, poems, essays and spoken word. Uh, the schools that participated were the Restart Educational Foundation, the Washington Middle School for Girls, both in DC, and the Providence Baptist Church Youth Ministry in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the, the third year medical students um, helped judge the posters, and so, uh, and they were judged in groups by schools. And so the uh, third place winner was the Washington Middle School for Girls. Second place was the Restart Educational Foundation. And uh, oh, that was first place. And the third, third place was the Providence Baptist Church Youth Ministry. So our next guest is a morning speaker. Um, I'm one of his biggest fans. And uh, he's a Morehouse man, and we'll forgive him for that since we're here at Howard University. Uh, oh, we won't forgive him. I hear some more Morehouse men in the, the audience. Oh, okay. It's okay. Um, no, Morehouse is a great school. Um, next to the podium, um, at the podium is going to be Mr. Robert Bailey from the Centers for Disease Control, who heads up the National Partnerships team. Welcome, Robert Bailey. Thank you very much. You know, I always get really concerned over the buildup, building high expectations, especially since everyone still looks like you're trying to defrost from walking in here this morning. So while I'm waiting for this to boot up, I just wanted to thank all of you again for inviting the CDC to participate in this, the second annual International AIDS Stigma Conference. And I think how fitting is it that here as we, we talk about that we're holding this first of all in the United States and that oftentimes when we talk about international and international AIDS, the United States normally isn't something that you normally think of. But we do know based upon the statistics that we have and, and upon the persons that are most impacted here in the United States that we have pockets here in the United States that rival those that are in Africa or in Asia. So it's important for us to be able to have that conversation here in the United States as well and to share that message with all of those of you out there who may be from places like Puerto Rico or Guatemala and some of the other places that President Robichaud uh, 
Rabot, excuse me, <laughs> Rabot mentioned earlier. So as uh, Lisa mentioned again, I'm Robert Bailey. I'm the National Partnerships Team Leader in, at uh, the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at the CDC, where we're responsible for preventing HIV infection in, in terms of uh, promoting testing, linkages to care. And so just for the next few minutes, I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what we're looking at is HIV here in the United States, talk about some of the challenges that are promoting that, and kind of setting the stage for that, the conversation that you're going to be having for, uh, for the day, which is the focus on HIV stigma. But I also like to always leave on a high note the fact that there is still hope in the midst of this crisis. So that we know that here we are, again, as it was mentioned earlier, that we're in the 30th year, the 30th year of HIV. And that here in the United States, over one, almost 1 1.2 million people are living with HIV. We see that they're made up from all races and ethnicities, men and women. We see that men are primarily in, um, impacted by the disease. We see here that even if you look at the, um, as we start talking about stigma, you start talking about those who are disproportionately impacted, that African Americans, although 14% of the population, make up nearly half of all new infections as well as you can see those of our Hispanic brothers and sisters who are also heavily impacted. And also, too, in terms that it's impacting all, all ages. So HIV isn't a young person's disease. It's not a middle-aged disease. It's not an older, older person's disease. It's an everyone's disease. And people are acquiring the, the disease through a number of ways, the primary one being those who, uh, men who have sex with men who have been bearing the burden since the very beginning of the epidemic. And in particularly, when we start looking among men who have sex with men, that in particularly black gay and bisexual men are particularly impacted, and that we live at a time that one in three black gay or bisexual men may be infected with HIV. One in three black or gay bisexual men may be infected with HIV. And so as I mentioned earlier, that over almost 1.2 million people living with HIV, and this particular graph this particular graph shows that now we're looking at about 48,000, you know, almost 50,000 new infections each year. The, the good news, I would say, is about that, that even though every year you have more and more people that have become infected with HIV, that this rate has been relatively stable. If you look at this graph, that the, the line is almost flat, which is good news, because normally, if you have more people who are infectious, then you would tend to think then the number of persons infected would go up. But the fact that that is level shows that there's been some progress with prevention. And so that's the reason why we have that the 1.2 million people living with HIV here in the U.S. But still, too many people who have HIV don't know that they have it. Of that 1.2, we know that one in five aren't aware that, they, that they're infected with HIV. So that's the 236,000 number that you see here, one in five. And so because they don't know that they, that they have HIV, they're unable to access HIV care and treatment, so, which means then that they are at greater risk for transmission. Because we, what we do know, that people who are on the antiretroviral therapy, that is able to suppress the, the level of the, the disease, the virus in their bodies, that makes them less infectious, which means then that there reduces the chance of spreading the disease to others. But if people don't know that they have, that they have HIV, then they're not necessarily going to be able to access treatment because they wouldn't necessarily see a need which means then that that's what leads to a greater risk for HIV transmission and for greater risk for, for disease progression and death. We know that people who are tested early and get access to care and adhere to that care, that it reduces the chance not only of them being able to, to spread the disease, but also increases the chances of them being able to live very long and, and healthy, healthy lives. But too often, we have people who are showing up as hospitals. I hear anecdotes all the time about people showing up and the first time that they find out that they have HIV, they're being hit with an AIDS diagnosis so that their disease has already progressed. And HIV in this respect is no different from any other condition. We know that was the same thing with cancer and with some of our other diseases, that the earlier you are diagnosed for the disease, it increases the chances then that you will have a better health outcome. The other thing I would note here, I don't have it on the slide, is that on Tuesday, the CDC, we, we released our, our uh, vital signs report, and I would actually encourage every one of you to go in and pick up that report. And it talks about how important care is and the fact that only 28% of people living with HIV have it under control. 
So again, I already mentioned the 1.2 million people and, the, and for those that have been diagnosed that only 28% have the virus under control. So what are some of the challenges and the things that are placing people at risk? Again, these are the same things that are placing people at risk for all types of um, conditions, that being poverty and homelessness, substance abuse, substance use and abuse, racism, homophobia. Some of the things that people in this room that you may have, that you may experience or, or your loved ones may have experienced are the things, the very things that are placing people not only at risk for acquiring HIV, but in particular then adding additional layers of stigma for those who may be living with the virus. So if you can imagine then, and I'll show you, I'll show you an example of this later on, that being homeless and the stigma associated with homeless. And so then you can only imagine then what it's like for that person if they also may, may happen to have HIV. And then the other thing, again, placing people at risk is the reason why all of you are here today, is the idea of HIV-related stigma and discrimination. And so although stigma has declined since, uh, as, you, as we think about actually uh, Magic Johnson, for example, that who I won't say, commemorated the 20th year of his announcement that he had HIV, which was just a, a few weeks ago, I believe it was like November 7th, or, or right around there, November 7th of 1991. And some of you may remember where you were at the time when Magic made that announcement. And I remember Magic was one of my favorite players, you know, still is one of my favorite, favorite people. And so, at, of course, up to that, that point, whenever someone came up and said that they were living with HIV, weeks later, they were dead. If you think about the Robert Redfords, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, Rock Hudsons, the Rock Hudsons, if you think about the Arthur Ashes, if you think about the Easy es everyone who had made that public announcement not too long afterwards, they were dead. And with that, you know, people, there was the hysteria that surrounded HIV, the idea that people didn't want to touch people who were living with HIV, didn't want to share the same water fountain, they didn't want to share the same plates and utensils, they didn't want to work with somebody, they didn't want to worship with somebody. They didn't want to go to school with somebody that has HIV. And so that then is what we're saying, that there has been some improvement and some decline in that. But still, we're living at a time, and this was just released this summer, that 45% of Americans would be uncomfortable having their food prepared by someone who is HIV positive. And that another 29% would be uncomfortable having their child in a classroom with an HIV positive teacher. And that 18% still would be uncomfortable working with someone with HIV. But here again, we are we're in the 30th year of HIV. We're at a time where you would think then that everybody would know how HIV is spread. Everybody would be educated to the point where this kind of stigma would no longer exist. But the fact is that it still does because not everyone has got the message. And so that's the reason why it's so important to have this conversation and that the reason that, that you take this information that you have today after you defrost and go back out there and share with other people who didn't have an opportunity, didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to attend, this, attend this session. And so the way that HIV-related stigma has been defined by some of our colleagues who published a paper in Social Science and Medicine back in 2003 is that HIV-related external stigma reflects the negative social identity ascribed to people living with HIV or AIDS by some people who are not affected by HIV. But you guys are well, I'm sure, well aware and, and well comfortable with that, the notion, the idea that people who aren't impacted tend to, tend to get up on a high horse or tend to discriminate because or to blame those who may, have, um, who may be going through various difficult situations. And so here are some of those examples that I had alluded to a little bit earlier. I'm just going to share just a couple of these because, again, you know, my father you know, once uh, was a pastored a Baptist church for about 30 years. We're going to hear from Dr. Pollard a little bit later on. And he always used to say that one need not be eternal in order to be everlasting. So I'm going to share this, this little bit and get out of the way so that the real conversations can take place. But as an example, there was a study that was done with 257 HIV positive women, 92% of whom were African American, and 44% reported negative consequences of disclosure. You know, one of the things we talk about is the importance of talking, the importance of creating an environment where people who are living with HIV have the opportunity to share that they're living with HIV without the threat or without the apprehension that they're going to be discriminated against. 
And we already know that that isn't, the, isn't always the case here. That if you recall back to the times of cancer, you know, we just cut, came off of Breast Cancer Month, was it October? Those of you who are Redskins fans or other NFL uh, um, fans of the NFL saw, saw the guys running around in the pink cleats, the, the referees walking around with the pink uniforms. We had pink gold posts, pink gloves. It was pink. But if you recall back maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you didn't have women running around proudly with bald heads. You didn't have three-day walks for cancer. Matter of fact, when microwaves were first introduced and people were first started popping microwave popcorn, you know, now there may be five or ten seconds left on the, the machine and people open up the door because the popcorn's ready. Well, back in the day, that didn't take place. Matter of fact, the popcorn would pop and people would probably wait a couple minutes before opening up the door because people were so concerned about increasing their, their risk of cancer. You had so many people who had passed away, family members who had cancer, but were afraid to talk about it because of the stigma associated with cancer. And we're seeing that the same thing is happening with, with HIV. But the important thing to note there with cancer is to look at the progression of how everyone looks at the, de at the disease and the fact of the concern and the concern and support the, out, the, the outpouring of support for those people who are living with HIV, I mean, sorry, living with cancer, but also for the persons who actually take care of them. So it's also important to note that a quarter of these women had lost friends because they disclosed that they had HIV. 23% or an, almost another 25% had been insult, insulted or sworn at because they were living with HIV. And that one in five had been rejected by their families because they disclosed that they had HIV. Also, I had mentioned this, the, 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 the example earlier of persons who may be homeless. In a, another study with, with these 637 persons living with HIV noted higher levels of stigma associated with they had poor self-assessed physical and mental health, poor adherence to HIV treatment, there was drug use, and decreased disclosure of HIV status to other people who may be in their social network or in their, and, their, and their sex partners because persons were finding, because of the effects of stigma, that, 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 that poor self-image, that poor or that lack of interest or love of yourself, then means that people then living with HIV were less likely then to want to adhere to the treatment, less likely to want to interact with other people or to disclose because of all the negative consequences that have come from disclosure or from living with, with HIV. Another one, another study that was done with HIV stigma in the gay community also talked about some of the other impacts of, of stigma that led to anxiety, loneliness, and, depress and depression, suicidal thoughts, uh, um, avoidance, or seeking partners in sex clubs and other, in other private sex parties where we know that risky sex takes place. So again, that, that having that lack of self-worth can lead to these other types of increased activities. I recall uh, back before actually before joining the CDC, I did some private consulting work and was responsible for the, the evaluation of a project that a health department was putting together that was reaching black, gay, and bisexual men. And so I remember looking through that two-way gla that glass and, and observing this focus group and hearing a few of these men talk about the idea that they saw that HIV was just it was just a uh, normal and expected part of being gay. And so as I sat and reflected on it, it's something I think about on a, on a daily basis actually with the work that we do. It's the idea that you think that your very existence or your very person or who you are is associated with HIV. You know, it's oftentimes the same thing as being uh, a black man as I look at the news and other things that when I grew up, I was originally from Detroit. And even though I didn't necessarily run in a bad crowd or even though I may have had a chance to go to school, I still saw myself as being at risk for dying early because I had had friends who had died early. Not necessarily from doing the wrong thing. Sometimes being in the right place can become the wrong place very quickly. And some of you, <laughs> some of you may know what I'm talking about with the idea. But the idea of being black, the idea that that means automatically being associated with negative outcomes you can see then how that same type of mentality can be applied to, to HIV. But there's hope. I promise you a little bit of hope. I'm gonna leave you with a little bit of hope today. And the hope is that 
through, we know that through HIV testing and care that it's possible again for people to live almost normal lives and long and healthy lives. There are many people, just like Magic, who's, who's living 20 years, has lived for 20 years, but people who have lived with the virus much longer than Magic Johnson, 25 years, 28 years, 30 years, that people are beating this disease, that HIV, we need to get to the point where HIV testing is so normal that people that we look at it the same way as getting tested for your cholesterol, getting your blood pressure checked, because HIV is a treatable disease now. It's the, although it's still a very serious condition, but we need to be looking at it the same way as we treat diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and, and other sorts of diseases. Because we know that early testing and linkages and adherence to care can again allow persons to live long and fulfilling lives. The other is the national HIV AIDS strategy that was just released last year, we're actually in the second year of that by President Obama. The idea that now the United States is like all the other countries around the world and that we now have a national strategy or plan for how all the government agencies can work together, how the business and the faith and the educational community can all work together, how private citizens can all work together to stomp out HIV here in the United States. Also, we're seeing mobilization, mobilization and increased campaign efforts. Just a few years ago, we launched the Act Against AIDS campaign, which was the, the, which was the first federally funded national campaign in almost 20 years to help refocus the nation's attention on the domestic HIV epidemic. Because oftentimes, as we always say, as the old folks used to say, that sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. So with that, we see that this has renewing that focus, that focus on the domestic epidemic here in the United States. This doesn't mean that it's not important in other places of the world, but the United States as a, a member of the international community, we also have our own responsibility to address HIV in our own country. And then also to the Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative that Lisa Fager Bediaco mentioned a little bit a little bit earlier. I always enjoy saying all of Lisa's name, Lisa Fager Bediaco. It's a very steam. <laughs> that where we're partnering with 19 of the leading um, African American and Latino civic social civic social and media organizations to integrate HIV into every aspect of of their organizations. Just as Dr. Robot had mentioned earlier with, with Howard University and that since its founding in 1867, there's been an inextricable link between the university and justice. Very similarly, when you think about the NAACP and the National Urban League and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and the National Council of Negro Women, it's that same type of inextricable, inextricable link exists. The same as for the National Hispanic Council on Aging, ESPIRA, Farm Workers Justice for our, for our for those who work with our Latino migrant workers, there is an inextricable link between what they have historically done for other issues, be it for jobs, be it for gender equality, be it for voter rights. Why can't, they use, why can't we continue to use that same energy, harness that same energy to address HIV? As I mentioned earlier, here are a few of those names and I just want to acknowledge a few, a few of our ally partners who are actually in the, in the building from Lisa Figueroa Bediaco with Congressional Black Caucus Foundation as well as Froney Jackson from National Council of Negro Women and, and others and so and would encourage you to be able to support their efforts. But then I'm going to leave you then with these probably four points and the reason again why there is hope for the future. At the end of the day we're still in the 30th year of HIV but even here 30 years later HIV is still 100 percent preventable. So this is where there may be a departure from some of the other diseases and the conditions I mentioned earlier. In that, you know, again, being, uh, being a young black man, I thank my father and grandfather and great-grandfather for genetically predisposing me to high blood pressure and all other kind of <laughs> conditions. And, and we can do what we can to help reduce our risk for the, pro the progression or for actually experiencing any of those, those types of issues. But with HIV, is still 100% preventable. And so why it's important then for us to, if we're gonna be able to address stigma, is to first get the facts. 30 years later, everyone thinks that they already know, and those who don't know probably don't feel comfortable saying that they don't know, which is the reason why you need to talk about it anyway. Get the facts and make sure that you know that you know that you know that you know the, the correct information, because misinformation is almost more dangerous than no information at all. And then again, to, to talk about it, then we want you to get tested. 
we've encouraged all Americans to get tested at the very least once in your life and for those persons who are at, in at increased risk to get tested even more frequently than that. And then also then to seek treatment. The idea that some people don't want to know because they don't think that, it, you know, that, that the experience or that there will be life after HIV, well there is life after HIV with the treatment and adherence to the therapies and everything else that's available to us now, people can, again, have long, healthy lives. And then some of you still, as I look around the room, still may not see where you may fit in this picture. As a part of this closure, I always say that I may be the most unlikely person to be working in HIV. I'm a heterosexual, heterosexual man who's never been, inf who's not infected, Matter of fact, growing up, I never even knew any person in my family or friends who was living with HIV or died from AIDS. So then why then would I get, why would I get involved with HIV? Well, the fact is that we are all people. And it reminds me of a story that some of you may be familiar with where there was some healing going on in a town. And these four friends had one of theirs that they were carrying along on a cot, that they climbed up on the roof and lowered the man through the roof so that he could be healed. And in that story, no one, we always hear about the man who was healed, jumped up and took his bed and ran off rejoicing. But there's not much more said about those four friends that brought him in. And I think is, the reason is that we don't need to know what their conditions were. But what we do know, and because they may not have been the one impacted, or in this case infected, but what we do know is that they saw that it was important that they showed enough care and support for that person, that they made sure that they created an environment where he had the support that he needed and that he got the care that he needed. One of the other things we'd like to leave with you would be the, kind of the, the preamble or the vision for the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which I think sums it up, where it says that the U.S. will become a place where new HIV infections are rare, and when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic circumstance, will have unfettered access to high quality, life extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. So that's the vision for our national HIV AIDS strategy. But we know that works, faith without works is dead that we have to be about the business and we don't have much time. So as was mentioned earlier, I, I do have a great fondness for Howard. I went to Morehouse. And one of the favorite sayings of Dr. Benjamin Mays was that I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to me to use it. I must count if I abuse it. I must suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Thank you very much. I encourage you to have the conversation. Thank you, Robert. Robert talked about testing. I wanted to remind everybody we have free HIV testing here at Howard University today in this building, uh, on this floor, in the back to your right, and also down at the punch out. Um, the punch out is two floors below and it's the eatery. So if anybody is hungry, um, take a little break, go get something to eat. Um, so coming to the stage is Dr. Rana. You're next. Um, and he, know, he needs no introduction. He is the brainchild, the man who had the vision um, for this conference last year and was able to get so many diverse organizations in a room uh, to make this happen. And so um, with that, Dr. Rana. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. You know, I, I wrote a page on gratitude, if you look at the program book, and I talk about miracles because when we started with this effort, we really had no money. We had no people. Uh, we were paid to do a job. Uh, and many miracles happened, but one day, I have to describe this miracle, we never asked, never called, and I see sitting on the table, Lisa. I says, who are you? He says, oh, we would like to partner with you in this effort. 
And of course, as you can see, she took over. <laughs> and we love you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I just want to give you a very brief perspective from the point of view of a clinician. Now, Patty, Lenora, many of you others would tell you that our patients are more than just patients because many of them, we start taking care of them when they were in the uterus. Um, the others, we start taking care of them at two years of age and now they are 25, 26. Uh, many people, Aaron, Patty, have taken these kids to help them in the boarding school. Um, they take them to their dorms. Um, they take care of them when they're goofing up on school. So uh, they, these kids are more, more than just our patient. But something that started hurting us very, very long ago, and it still remains a major pain, that despite the fact that conversation has increased, Compared to last year when we held the conference, it was very rare to find the word stigma in the newspaper, very rare to hear it on the news media, and I had never heard it from the White House. But thank God, today it's on many people's tongue. But if you look at, you know, you put your money where your mouth is. Uh, we are far, far away from where the money is. $15 billion going into vaccine research. You look at the medication, you know, billions and billions of dollars going into aid for getting medication. But you look at the budget to overcome stigma, and I'll look at Robert, and I can look at many other people. Believe me, it is no more than hundreds of thousands of dollars. When requests for applications come, they are for international places, like this problem doesn't exist. Believe me, Washington, D.C. is no different than Sweto, South Africa. Washington, D.C. is no different than Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, or a place uh, in, in um, South America. So I, I, I just want to give you these brief, brief glimpses. This is the mother of one of my patients. I call her Rachel, and she was in my clinic. And I said, you know, Rach, she has missed, your child has missed so many appointments. Why? Why? And she looked at me and she broke down. She says, Dr. Rana, you know, something that happened four years ago makes me hate wanting to come to the hospital because hospital made me feel untouchable. She said, I was in labor with my child, the child you see, and I was told I'm going to have C-section at 8 a.m. And here I'm waiting. And then half an hour before comes a physician. Oh, your test came back positive. And she said, I'm still waiting. It's 9 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock. And the nurse came. Well, you know, we are still find to, trying to find somebody to do C-section on you. She said, it was so clear to me. Nobody wanted to touch me. And believe me, 30 years later, it hasn't changed. Stigma prevents individuals from seeking medical care. Unless we, as a doctor, I stand before you, the man in the mirror, unless we change, we cannot change people to come to us. Young lady, she's turned 20. We have taken care of her for a long, long time. She changed four schools before she dropped out. A family member divulged her diagnosis to a school friend, and every school, there were few people or many people, it didn't matter. They harassed her. They called her saucy, they called her juicy, they called her dirty. And she would pick fights and leave the school. And finally she got thrown out of school and she hasn't finished high school. Stigma stops an individual from getting a basic human right to learn and to educate themselves. And you've seen the poster, but this is one of the most painful cases. Chelsea died last year, November. She was 19, and I had been her, her doctor for a very, very long time. And what was sad was she would look at me and call me Dad, you know, she had like three Ds at the end. 
and she wanted to be a stand-up comedian. But behind her laughter and bravado was a very broken heart. At home, she had separate dishes. Her family sanitized surfaces wherever she touched them, and she felt rejected. In shame, she refused to take her medication. She could have lived a long, productive life only if she could have taken her medications. Stigma and shame caused her death. So folk, stigma kills people. Stigma is, is not such a small thing. A bad glance, a, a, a slight hesitation leaves a major, major effect on people. Uh, something very, very serious. So as I conclude, stigma, I want us to think about it. Stigma violates every single human right. The right to life, the right to health, the right to education, the right to freedom of movement. I can give you example after example, but there are 60 or 70 countries in the world where you cannot enter. US was one of them until a year ago. That if you have HIV, you cannot get a visa. Can you believe it? Right to move freely. That's a basic human right. And I'm ashamed, but Saudi Arabia, many of you may be listening over there on webcast, many people could not perform pilgrimage, which is a mandated duty on a Muslim because Saudi Arabia does not allow a person with HIV to enter. Others lied and they didn't take their medication, so they missed two, two weeks of medication. Others got caught with medication and were turned away. Stigma takes away your right to privacy. Stigma takes away your right to have a family. Stigma takes away your right to have a child, as Vanessa would tell you later, and stigma takes away your right to be free of discrimination, degrading treatment, liberty, and security. So for many people with HIV, life is nothing but rejection and isolation. Until we change, Robert, our attitude toward, we, we, we can't do it without money. We can't do without many different centers working on these issues. We cannot do it without public service campaign. And for those in media, we cannot do without you. But most importantly, it's the man in the mirror and the woman in the mirror. We can't do without you. So as Robert said, we have come a long way. I mean, 30 years later, when I started taking care of children with HIV, we had no medication. Zippo. Today, we have 20, 30 medication. We made so much progress. But unfortunately, humanity, we are stuck in Stone Age, believe me. That we respond to, we respond to these kinds of situations in situation of fear and ignorance with, with the very, very primitive responses, we shy away. And I, I, I feel free. I see my colleague. They see, oh, they look at the chart. What do they do? Oh, HIV. Their hands immediately reach towards gloves. Man, for phys basic physical examination, do you, do you really need gloves? And I look at medical students, do you really need gloves? Oh, oh I, I, I try to put it on for anybody. Oh, I had ulcer on the skin. Bullshit. You know, I, uh, <laughs> you know this, is, this is how we perpetuate stigma. A person walking out of that clinic is never want to come back to your clinic. They never want to come back to close to the hospital. So our behavior towards those needing most compassion as a society remains despicable. And folks, I just want to say, you know, HIV is a virus, but stigma is a virus which is worse than HIV. St stigma as a virus infects our brain cells designed to show love, compassion, mercy and empathy, and it stops them from, just like a computer virus, you know? It's a program cannot function, okay? The minute stigma virus infects our brains, boom, none of that works anymore. So a person today is getting infected every 16 seconds. Why are the prevention efforts not working? We know, 
stigma has a major role to play in it. And Robert mentioned many of this. So folks, I leave you with this. Stigma is darkness and ignorance. Today, we are here to learn that stigma is something we can do about. We can do something about it. We can wipe out stigma. We can get rid of it because the buck stops here. It's the man in the mirror who is responsible for it, and he and she can do something about it. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everybody. And I need to say good morning, America. We have seven states confirmed participation and 15 that they are trying to log in as we speak. Buenos dias, Latino America. Pan American Health Organization has linked all Latin America to our conference. Good morning, Uganda and South Africa. And I hope I'm not missing anyone because we are receiving so many confirmations of people participating globally. I'm going to try to be very brief, telling you a story of why a center. For the ones who were here last year, we launched the center that's supposed to be working on stigma uh, based a little bit on health literacy knowledge on our patient population. So I'm not gonna go in details of the center. You have your handouts and my presentation is going to be on the website, whocanyoutell.com. A couple of things that I want to emphasize is why a center? You may have the question. We had the question. We have very valid reasons for a center. You can see the mission and the definitions of stigma that we have, that CDC has, that NIH has, but most, the most important piece is to remember that stigma is a social opportunistic disease that attaches to many illnesses. And actually the bottom line is that increased mortality rates. We know that is the attitude that spreads HIV. We know about how much money are we spending because we don't do anything about health literacy and we are gonna continue spending that money. We know that now we have a national action plan to improve health literacy. And please remember, pretty much nine out of every 10 people doesn't understand when you're teaching them, educating them because of the lack of health literacy skills. But that's not what I'm talking to you today, right? I say, why a center? So we know that we have some goals with this plan to improve health literacy, public domain, and they're gonna be on our web. Um, very important to realize that our culture defines so many things, including who we're supposed to stigmatize or stereotype or discriminate against. Um, obviously, the center is in adherence with the national HIV strategy, the national action plan to improve health literacy, national standards for cultural linguistic uh, service and, and healthcare, and the cultural competency continued. As any center, Research is one piece. We're gonna be developing markers and tools, trainings, technical assistance, monitor and evaluate, but that is not what I told you, right? We're gonna be talking about why. And then some of the whys are very much scientifically based. We try to become a forum for all of you, for all of us. Yes, we try to establish this kind of global knowledge network and develop this society-wide health response. And we need to fight for health as a human right. Some other important reasons, bringing together all stakeholders, we're bringing you together, and we want more people coming together for the center. And uh, of course, we're gonna be fostering innovative solutions and uh, facilitate research and et cetera, et cetera, but that's why the center. And that's why the center. And I need all your pictures here because the main reason for the center 
is all of you. And as any, any university can stay, we're going to be talking Latin. Peribus Unitas with United Forces. That is why the center. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. I think that summed it up. Why the center? Uh, next, coming to the stage, I really don't need this paper because even though I've met um, Mayor Ford a couple occasions years ago, um, he leaves a lasting impression on you. And so um, he has a lot of titles. That's why I picked up this paper. Uh, so today, the titles for Mayor Ford. Mayor Ford has, uh, what, uh, you were mayor for over 28 years as the mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama. So uh, he is also the chair of the steering committee for the Center for Stigma and Health Literacy um, here at Howard University. And he is also the executive director for the World Conference of Mayors. Um, he sits in the room with the President Obama. He, um, he is going to bring the vision. Welcome, Mayor Johnny Ford. Let's give Lisa Better Cole of the Bedia Cole of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation a round of applause. You've done an outstanding job. Robert Bailey, let's give it up. Morehouse man. <laughs> Dr. Pollard, you're going to bless us later. Dr. Vargas Jackson, powerful little lady, but great power. Give her a hand. Dr. Rayner, thank you for your passion. Thank you. And to all of you, turn to the person next to you and smile, because this is World AIDS Day. Give that a round of applause. Uh, so I bring you greetings. First, as a former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, the home of the flying, fighting Tuskegee Airmen, and the home of Tuskegee University, the pride of the swift growing South. It is my honor also to greet you as the founder of the World Conference of Mayors, La Conference Mondiale des Mayors, the United Nations of Cities, representing mayors in South Africa. Give our brothers and sisters in South Africa who are watching us today and who are participating. Representing mayors in Kampala, Uganda. Give them a round of applause. Good morning, Uganda. In Puerto Rico and Mexico. Mucho gracias for work watching in. Give them a hand. And to others from around the world who may be joining us here today via the internet and through media. It is my honor as the founder, co-founder of the National Policy Alliance as well, and my co-founder, the Honorable Webster Guillory, to greet you on behalf of the National Policy Alliance, the organization which is made up of the nine national African-American public policy organizations, which include the Congressional Black Caucus, Lisa, representing our African Americans in the Congress. The National Black Caucus of State Legislators, representing African American legislators across the country. The National Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials, representing more than 5,000 local elected officials, mostly city council members and others. The National Black Caucus of County Officials, the Honorable Webster Guillory, who is chair of NABCO, 
the National Conference of Black Mayors and the World Conference of Mayors. The National Bar Association, representing more than 40,000 black lawyers and judges from across the nation. The National Black Caucus of School Board members, who are the voice of our children, who must be educated so that they can, so that when they finish school in the United States of America, they will be able to compete with others from around the world. Blacks in Government, our largest organization, representing more than 2.5 million black government employees who execute and who carry out public policy working at the local, the state, and the national level. As well as the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, which is our secretariat. Collectively, the National Policy Alliance represents more than 11,000 black elected and appointed officials from across the nation. And we all support the Stigma and Literacy Center here at Howard University. It is my honor as well to issue a proclamation on behalf of our mayors from around the world. I was so proud as I walked down Pennsylvania Avenue last night to see the White House decorated for the Christmas season and to see hundreds of children, hundreds of children there in front of the White House. But to also see that beautiful red ribbon draping from the White House, that means we have a man in the White House who cares about the fight and the struggle to cure and to conquer HIV AIDS in this nation. That means we're moving in the right direction. And so today, the World Conference of Mayors and the National Policy Alliance, by authorization of the Board of Directors, I hereby proclaim this day as World AIDS Day. And I ask all of you who are committed to the fight and the struggle to conquer HIV AIDS and other infectious diseases, to stand on your feet and put your hands together and let the world know that you stand up in this fight. You are not ashamed of stigma and you're going to let the whole world know that we are together in this fight. This is World AIDS Day, not only in the United States of America, but in Uganda, in South Africa, in Puerto Rico, and all over the globe. Thank you so much. Now for the members of the Stigma Committee, Steering Committee, please stand those of you who work with Dr. Vargas Jackson and Dr. Rayner, the other members of the committee, I want them to stand as well. Let's give them a hand. One other. Let's give them all a hand. I want to say to President Ribot, the president of Howard University, we thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership at Howard Universities. The HBCUs are very important in this struggle against HIV AIDS. And we are working with the other black colleges to make sure that we develop a network to work together against this common enemy. Now the question may come to your mind, why do I commit myself to serve as chair of this steering committee? I am not infected by HIV AIDS. I've not lost anyone in my family to HIV AIDS. So the question is, why is Johnny Ford involved in this effort? Well, I'll tell you, Robert Bailey, you challenged me for nearly four years ago and the others at CDC when you invited leaders from around the nation to come to Atlanta to get involved in this effort. There were movie stars there. There were sports figures there. There were religious leaders there, Dr. Pollock. There were people from all over the nation, but I was the only mayor, even Mayor Shirley Franklin was not there. 
And I said to the CDC, how in the world do you expect to launch an effective fight against HIV AIDS in the cities of America without involving the mayor? And when I said, when I made that statement, the CDC challenged me and said, well, Mr. Mayor, you're the founder of the World Conference of Mayors and the National Conference of Black Mayors. We challenge you to get involved to mobilize the mayors of the nation in this effort. And so we are now involved. Mayors, the president of the National Conference of Black Mayors, Mayor Bowser, the president of the World Conference of Mayors, Mayor Ron Davis, and all of us are committed because mayors must take the leadership in their cities to not only issue proclamations today, and they are doing that, but mayors are getting tested today. Mayors must be on the front line and mobilize their citizens to get involved in this particular effort. I'm involved not because I have been stricken with HIV AIDS, but because my family has sickle cell anemia in my family. I lost a nephew to sickle cell anemia. I almost died as a youngster simply from sickle cell trait, which you can normally live a normal life. But in my particular case, playing football in high school was struck from the rear by a 250 pound tackler that injury caused internal bleeding, which they could not stop because of the tension and the stress. My blood cells sickle. Therefore, they ooze through the membrane of the tissue of the kidney into the urinary tract. And at that time, they had no way to stop it. So here I was, a perfectly normal, healthy looking youngster but literally dying and bleeding to death. Thank God I had a mother and a father who did not have any money, didn't even have insurance, but somehow my father took me to a place, St. Uh, Margaret's Hospital in, 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 in Columbus, Georgia, and they found a doctor who was able to stop the bleeding. They had told me that as a young man that I'd never reached the age of 30, but I was determined to overcome it. But thank God someone cared about me and someone helped me. And today I'm able to stand here today and be alive. Well, if we could overcome it with sickle cell trait and still that disease, sickle cell, there is no cure. But if we can overcome that, and if I could overcome it and still live, they are those who are living with the HIV virus. They can overcome that challenge. It's an illness, it's a, sick, it's a sickness. Stigma prevents people from getting help. People are shamed, and therefore they don't want anyone to know. They don't want their family to know. They don't want their neighbors to know. You've got to grow up, people. You've got to realize that you have got to forget about being ill. Forget about what people may say. Go and get help. There's help not only on the way, there's help today. And our message today and our vision today is to have a world where the peoples of the world will no longer take a second look at a person who's ill with HIV or sickle cell anemia or whatever. They are all our brothers and our sisters. We are all human beings. God made us all. We should love each and every one. We should reach out and join hands together there's an old saying in the South, Reverend Pollard, let us walk together, children, and not be weary. And that's the message I leave with you today. Let us go forth from this place, Howard University, on World AIDS Day, committed that we're going to fight, fight until we overcome HIV AIDS. If they can put a man on the moon, they can overcome and find a cure for HIV AIDS. We will march from this place, 
marching together, children, and not be weary. And we will not stop until there is stigma no more. And we can all stand on our feet and say that we are the soldiers in the battle to overcome HIV, AIDS, and stigma. Thank you, Mayor Ford. Um, coming to the stage right now, we're a little behind, and I realize I didn't mention why Congresswoman Norton wasn't here. Um, she was called to a uh, committee hearing and had to do a presentation this morning, and she sends her regards, and she was very much looking forward to being here today. Uh, with that, I'm going to bring uh, Reverend Dr. Alton Pollard, the Dean of Howard University Div uh, uh, the Dean of Howard University School of Divinity to, uh, to give us the invocation. Thank you. Whether you are in your seats here or in many parts of the globe, we invite you now to take a moment of introspection and join with me in prayer. For the parentless child, the bullied child, the homeless man, the abused woman, all who have been impacted by AIDS, the business person, the sanitation worker, the caregiver the educator, the homemaker. Without discrimination, HIV has impacted them all. On this World AIDS Day, in the presence of bigotry, prejudice, and stigma, We search for a way to overcome our fears. Red state, blue state, or purple. On either side of the Atlantic Ocean, beyond the Pacific, and in countries north and south. In my neighborhood and on your street, we join our hearts in prayer without respect of religion, education, or economic background. Hear our prayer, O universe, and guide us to that place where we will not only educate and prevent and treat and cure but where we will no longer allow stigma to have sway over the lives of any human beings. I am because we are, and because of this faith. You belong to me, and I belong to you. Every human being, irrespective of condition, a child of the universe, my sister, and my brother. May we become the answer to our prayers. Ashe, Amen, Iman. Thank you. Um, this concludes our morning, uh, I mean, our morning session, and we're going to get ready for our plenary one. So please, let's give a great um, a round of applause to our morning speakers.
Uh, Miss Caressa Cameron was crowned Miss America in January 2010. She has been personally been affected by HIV AIDS and has been educating people since she was nine years old. She is currently um, back in school after her reign. I believe you go to Virginia Commonwealth, VCU. Um, and uh, so she has made, she made HIV AIDS education and prevention her personal platform. So we want to welcome uh, Miss America 2010, Caressa Cameron. All right. Well, good morning. I want to say first, thanks so much for having me again. This is now my second year at the Conference on Stigma, and so I am so honored to be here. And as she said, HIV and AIDS was my platform as Miss America, but now it's also my job. I work at AIDS United as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Organizer, and so I am the head of Washington, D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia. So I'm honored to be here, and I am excited to introduce our extraordinary panel of people who are going to be speaking with us today. Um, after they have all spoken, we will be giving you all a question and answer session after each one of them speaks so that you can ask them some questions and I will introduce them one at a time prior, one at a time prior to uh, them giving their presentation. And so, um, Dr. Popper, so you were put on the spot, so I'm going to read your bio first and you'll get to go first. All right. Uh, Gregory Pappas, MD, PhD, is the Senior Deputy Director of the District of Columbia Department of Health and leads the HIV-AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration. He has over 25 years of experience in global health and works in more than 30 countries. He received his MD and PhD degrees from Case Western Reserve. In the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Pappas directed the Office of International Health and served as the Senior Policy Advisor to the Surgeon General David Satcher. He was also a major author on the five-year strategy for PEPFAR. Please welcome Gregory Pappas. Good morning, everyone. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Vargas, Dr. Rana, all of Howard for putting together this very important um, event today. It's a great, I, you know, I, I've lived in D.C. since 1987, and it's wonderful to see how we're combating stigma. This, I'm going to talk about stigma today in the District of Columbia, and we still have serious problems, but the fact that you're here, the fact that this conference is going on, and so many things going on across the city today uh, represent huge strides. Strides. We're miles away from where we were in the past, and, and I think I want to give this group a uh, hand of applause. So first, I want to uh, welcome you, uh, those of you who aren't from the city, to Washington, D.C. on behalf of the mayor of the District of Columbia, who's my boss. I think of myself as probably the luckiest city AIDS director in the United States to have a mayor who is an HIV activist. I do not have to tell him anything. This guy goes. He has heard the call, both nationally and internationally, of AIDS activists calling for leadership at the highest level, and he's formed a commission for HIV AIDS, which he chairs. He doesn't hand it off to somebody else. He's there at the table making changes. I'm going to say something about that. I'm very inspired today by UNAIDS um, recent report, Getting to Zero. And you know what? If anybody's going to get to zero, it should be DC first. It should be DC first. What, is, what does getting to zero mean? It means no, no new infections, no infant deaths, and no one uh, no, no one dying of HIV. So getting to zero is something, it's a, new, it's a new concept, it's a new part of our dialogue, but let's really think about that seriously today on this day. DC still has a serious AIDS epidemic. There are currently about 16,000 people who are HIV positive. We have about 5,000 cases over the last four years. 3% of the District of Columbia is HIV positive. And only about half to a third of those who are positive know they're positive. A lot of people are out there in public doing what they're doing, HIV positive, and they don't even know it. A lot of them, a lot of people. And it's true all over the city. Uh, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, calls an epidemic at 1% of a population. White people have 1%. All our wards have 1%. Over 65 has 1%. We have an epidemic in the District of Columbia. I'm going to say more about that. We have serious challenges. Two or three people are, are diagnosed every day in the District of Columbia from HIV, and one person still dies. I'm going to say more about that. But we have a lot, of, a lot to be pr proud of, a lot to be thankful for. This year, we set three new records, a new record for condoms, 
we 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 have not we're now giving 120,000 uh, um, HIV tests every year. That's a 30% increase over three years, increase over last year. We set a new record for condoms, 10 times the number of condoms, male and female condoms, since 2007. We're up to 5 million condoms a year. We've set a record for uh, connecting to people to care. It used to be take about a year between the time a person was uh, diagnosed that they found out they were HIV positive and, and made their way to a doctor. Now it's down to about three months. Seventy percent of people get to the doctor within three months. Uh, we are doing HIV testing all over the city. It used to be there was one or two places in town. You know, you can get an HIV test at the DMV in the District of Columbia. This month we started at the income maintenance centers, the, the old welfare offices. We started this month, actually five days ago, already 170 people have been tested. Successful program, unfortunately, two people found positive or, po or good because they may not, may not have found, um, found out that other, other ways. We have a city where the mayor has called for treatment on demand, where other jurisdictions, and I'm not going to men mention any, any state across the river, we do not have waiting lists in District of Columbia. If you're HIV positive, you can get medication in the District of Columbia. This is a national and international call of activists, and our mayor has heard this call and responded. We have had a 60% decline in new cases among inter intravenous drug users. This is because of needle exchange. DC has a very effective, very uh, advanced needle exchange program that is working, that is preventing the disease, something that's paid for with your DC tax dollars and that the federal government has tried repeatedly to block. Not their fe not, not federal pe taxpayers dollars that we pay anyway, not those dollars. I'm telling you, it's saying the dollars that you pay in DC taxes, they try to block those. So, so far they haven't been successful and this program is a national model. There has not been one child born with HIV in the District of Columbia since 2009. That's a big accomplishment. And recently, the mayor's task force recommended and the mayor has enacted a fast track. We can't let people fall through the cracks because they have mental health disease or, or, or substance abuse problems. It's hard when people have multiple problems to get care. So the mayor has created a fast track to get people into care when they have multiple problems. So those are the facts, but statistics, as a sage said, are human faces with the tears wiped off of them. So this is still a big problem. Here's a case of a man, a 34-year-old gay black man, who came to the hospital about a year ago with, with HIV and syphilis. He had a CD4 count of two. His immune system had been destroyed. And he refused care. He refused care in part because of stigma. Stigma is killing people. This poor gentleman went home, came back about six months later with pneumonia, and died in the hospital two weeks later. Stigma according to the former director of the uh, UN, Ki Moon Bang, is, uh, remains the single most important barrier to public action. It's the main reason why too many people are afraid to see doctors, to determine whether they have diseases, or to seek treatment if so. It helps make AIDS a killer. This is a global problem, and it's still a problem in DC. Research tells us, this is research uh, in the US, that uh, stigma, but study participants uh, who have never engaged in HIV care are less likely to know someone else who's HIV positive or have some assistance in making their medical appointment. So if you don't know of any, anybody who's possible, or anybody who's positive, you're afraid. So when someone comes out as HIV positive, they're helping someone. They're helping themselves, they're helping the family, but they're helping another person who's failing to disclose. And they're also more likely to deny that they're HIV positive. So stigma is still, this is a national study, still very much a reality. In DC, we see it in the numbers again. We're going to go through a lot of numbers here, uh, talking about the indirect effect of, of, of stigma, the way, this, the way stigma plays out in testing, in treatment, but then show you some, some data specifically in, on, uh, on stigma itself. So one of the ways we think about stigma is progressing to AIDS. So you get an HIV infected. But prog progressing to AIDS mean you didn't get tested and you didn't get treated in a day when there are tests, test, there's testing anywhere, everywhere. As I said, we can, you can get tested at the DMV in DC. 
and we have treatment on demand. So why are people still progressing to, 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 to AIDS? And in fact, 31% of, of blacks who are HIV positive progressed to AIDS within 12 months of their, of their diagnosis. About the same among Hispanics, 36%. After one year after their diagnosis, they're still not in treatment. They progress to AIDS. It's 45% of drug users, 43% of MSM I I IUD. So we've got people who get diagnosed and they still progress to AIDS. They're not getting care. They're not in a city that's got treatment on demand, in a city that's got ample number of doctors to, to treat them. It's a grim story. It's a grim story. But here's another story. Uh, this is a 45, these are both real people. This is a woman I met a couple weeks ago, 45 year old black woman. And due to shame and stigma, she was unable to disclose to her family and she refused medication. She was near death. Through the work of one of our wonderful CBOs, community based organizations funded by the Department of Health, she was able to overcome her stigma. They built her up, her self-confidence, they empowered her. She was finally able to disclose to her family and her children. She hadn't even told her kids. And they said, Mama, what's wrong with you? They're praying for her. You know, you're sick, you're sick. She finally went, started taking the medication after she, she didn't want to take the medication in front of her kids. She finally took the medication. Two weeks later, she was back better. Now she's a national leader, speaks on Capitol Hill. That's a, that's, a, that's, a tr that's a story of power, that's a story of strength, that's a t story of empowerment, overcoming stigma. It can happen. So here we are in the District of Columbia and we're making progress. Uh, linkage to care, I say, as I said, is a success story. We have uh, th this program, number of programs, a number of programs called navigator programs where someone, usually someone who's HIV positive, helps a person who's new newly diagnosed get over their fear and get to a doctor and start their care. It used to be, you see in the first bar, 2005, about half the people, it took them a year to get in care. Now that's down to 17. In fact, this year is a, a, a new record. 71% of kids, of, of, of people HIV positive, get into care within a year. Uh, there's still disparities. Blacks and whites are somewhat different. Linkage to care, less than three months. Uh, whites still are a little bit ahead of, of blacks, but that number has also been proving, improving, and we're working on that disparity. That's an, a major issue for the, both the national HIV AIDS plan and DC's efforts to overcome disparities. Another way to look at, at stigma is CD4 count at time of diagnosis. So CD4 count is the, is the number that we measure your immune count, your immune status. How strong is your immune system? If the, if the immune system is, is low, your CD4 count is low. So if you're, at the time of your diagnosis, when you go and get your CD4 count, if it's low, it means you've had the disease a long, long time. And we see here that over the years, the CD4 count at time of diagnosis has improved. That, that means that we are finding people earlier and earlier in the disease. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. You don't want, you don't want to wait till you're on death's door to get an HIV test. You want, to get a te you want to get tested as soon as possible and get on treatment as soon as possible because you want to improve your, um, you want to preserve your immune system. We've done, um, so, Stigma is out there. It's with us all. We're all afraid of disease. It's, I think it's kind of a human, a human uh, trait. It's why the, um, the, the Bible and all religious, uh, religious texts all through the world always teach about loving the sick because it's, it overcomes our, our basic human nature. Um, but it's not just in the public. It's also in doctors. Doctors uh, do not know about the severity of HIV in the District of Columbia. 72% in our 2011 survey said that they did not know the severity of HIV in District of Columbia doctors. Tw only 28% of them correctly stated that all four quadrants of the district had a severe and generalized epidemic. More, more detail on that same fact. 51% of physicians in the district are not implementing testing rec recommendations. And while 91% of our physicians agreed that it was important for uh, patients to routine, uh, receive routine testing, only 21% of physicians offer that test. So we've got a, lot, a long ways to go. All sorts of things doctors said. I was 
a little bit shocked as a, as a physician I was a little bit ashamed that you know my colleagues who were supposed to be educated said oh it's not in my population wrong uh, it's east of the river wrong oh this is not an HIV place wrong uh, what do I do if someone becomes violent? Come on, you're a doctor. Get over it. You know, <laughs> I didn't go to medical school to become a counsel. So what did you go to doc? Why are you a doctor if you're not there to help people with a serious disease? So this is the sort of thing that's still out there, and uh, I'm glad that Howard, in particular, is having this conference because, of course, it's a public conference, it's open to, to everyone, but this is a medical school and, it, and a leader of, of medicine in the district and is helping tear down these barriers in, in the district. Um, I'm going to try to come to um, a conclusion here. We do lots of surveys, um, uh, amazingly, among heterosexuals, men who have sex with men, and drug, in, drug in, in, injectors. Those people who find out they're HIV positive, part of our survey, 70% of them have seen a doctor in the last year, but no one offered them a test. So people are seeing, you know, in DC we've got 93% of adults with health insurance and 96% of kids who have health insurance. We have one of the highest, after Massachusetts, we're number two in the nation in terms of insurance coverage. So Washingtonians have health insurance. They're going to the doctors, and their doctors aren't giving them HIV tests. Um, just a final uh, note on stigma. Um, this is among popula in the population. Um, people uh, want to keep their uh, about people. People who are HIV positive would want to keep their status private from close friends or family. They would better keep it a secret, and that's over half of them. Would not tell their friends that they have HIV. About thirty percent. And if someone in your immediate household was HIV positive, would you be fearful of contacting HIV from regular household? Still, 10 to 30% of them believe that. There's no way to get HIV from ca casual contact, con uh, contact, but people still believe that. 10 to, 10 to 30%, which is really quite shocking. So what are we doing? Very briefly, we're changing our conversation. We're messaging. We have a very robust uh, program of uh, Ask for the test, big media, you see these on buses and, and billboards, in doctor's offices. We're working with uh, doctors, we're working with consumer groups. Um, we're breaking down myths. As I say, we're very happy about our DMV and Income Maintenance uh, Center testing program. I'm going to leave you with messaging. The way we talk about HIV in public in the media, I think currently promotes stigma. How many of you have heard DC is like Africa, DC has an HIV as bad as Africa? How many of you have you heard that? Everyone's heard that. Okay, so it's a statistical oddity. We have 3.4 HIV prevalence in the District of Columbia. Many African countries have about the same. But we're not a city, we're not a state, we're not a country. We are a jurisdiction that's cut out of a, of a metropolitan area. We're part of, a, part of a city. If you look at metropolitan D.C., D.C. And the, and, the, and, and, the, and the suburbs, and compared it to Atlanta, compared it to Baltimore, compared, compared to Philadelphia, we have lower HIV rate. In, in fact, in a study by the CDC, the 12 cities study, half of people who are HIV uh, positive live in 12 cities. DC is one of those 12 cities, and it's kind of in the middle. Now, if you look at studies of inner cities, inner city Baltimore, inner city New York, inner city Detroit, inner city Atlanta, HIV rate is high like DC. In fact, higher, four, five, six percent. So again, I don't want to make a mistake uh, or mislead you is that DC doesn't have a serious AIDS problem. We do, we do. But it's not li unlike other, other, other cities. It's misleading. I'll say it in front of this group. I think it, I find it kind of racist to say that. It's, it's you know, it's like, oh, that, that, that black city, see all that HIV in that black city. It's just not accurate. So let's not shy away from HIV. Let's not pretend it's not a problem, but let's also not promote this notion that DC somehow is an outlaw and has such terrible HIV become other, other places. That's stigma too.
Let's get to zero. We can do it by working together government, business, research, the, commu the community, and the university. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Pappas. We will take the time now to take about a couple of questions. Um, we we'll have about five minutes or so. If you have a question, you could stand at the mic right there. Um, make an orderly line if there's more than one of you at the line and then he will answer the questions and then we will be moving on. So are there any questions? Well, I have one, Dr. Pappas. Yes, <laughs> My question is, um, how is DC leading in the fight regarding syringe exchange uh, so that the band is not reinstated and what can we do to help and how can you lead the charge in other states? Thank you. Uh, the um, needle exchange program is paid for by DC tax dollars. Uh, it's going very strong. Uh, if we had more money, I'd like to put more money in. It's a tight time, but we're do, you know we, we give out a lot of a lot of needles, and we're you know as they say we're seeing decreased uh, in, in infections due to uh, intravenous drug users. As citizens, you can support the mayor and our senator Holmes Norton in fighting any attempt to let Congress take that away. The the, con the, the mayor was 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 arrested because the federal government tried to block DC local taxpayers' dollars to, be, uh, to pay for abortion. And they backed on it. As you know, because we're not a state, our, fed, our local tax dollars have to go through the federal process for authorization. They, they, uh, they allow us to spend our own money. In that process, they can disallow us for spending our own money for needle exchange. It hasn't happened. Every year they threaten, it never has happened. We need to be vigilant, we need to be aware, and we need to be activists and support our leadership in, in ensuring that city has, the city spends its money in the way that we seal fit based on our view of, of, of the nature of this epidemic. Thank you. Sir? Executive Director of the National African American Drug Policy Coalition, Incorporated, and one of our concerns is the problem of convincing doctors to get and to administer the test and getting people to, and educating our people, getting the message out. If the message is not known, how do you deal with educating teenagers who are starting to, to engage in sexual exploration of the risk of not only gonorrhea and syphilis, but HIV AIDS, and how do we get people into quicker service? Those are some of the practical problems that we as an advocacy or an educational organization are trying to get people to deal effectively with the idea of stigma. Well, I congratulate you and I thank you. Uh, I, I use it, this is an extremely important issue. Everybody, the DC Health Department suggests that everybody in the district is tested once a year. How many people are tested once a year? A few, good, good, a few, but not everybody. And in fact, only about one third of the city, based on our statistics, is tested every year. So we, to, to, to we, promote getting everybody te and getting doctors to administer the test. Well, part of it is asking for the test. You know, there's public awareness. Doctors, patients need to ask doctors for their, you know, they've got insurance. Doctor drew, drew blood for uh, their uh, cholesterol or whatever for $1.50 extra, you know, that's included in your health insurance. You get your HIV test. So asking for the test is important. Let me use this as an opportunity for doctors. There's a lot of mis mis uh, misunderstanding, including here at Howard, I'm sorry to say, that, oh, it's illegal to do HIV testing unless you get a written consent. Not true. It's not true. Oh, you have to do an hour of pre-test counseling. Not true. It's just like a regular test. That's the policy. Dr. Ochter sent out an email to all licensed physicians, nurses, and, and other people who are licensed by the District of Columbia this month, actually last month, now we're in December, in November, stating what the policies were, also giving you billing codes of how you bill, you know, what number you put down in the form so you can get paid for, you know, doc doctors should be paid for their work, billing codes there, so it's very clear that it, it is an easy, it's like, like any other medical test in the District of Columbia, there's no restriction. And anybody tell you that, oh, well, you gotta do this and that, tell them to read their email. Question: In dealing with people released from D.C. jail, at least in the previous administration, I'm not sure whether it's changed at this point. 
people who are being released from jail could opt out of being tested when they're being released. Why can't we mandate that everybody coming out of prison be, in fact, uh, tested, especially young men who sometimes are victims of sodomy or rape in prison, sometimes become HIV infected and don't even know they are, come out and have promiscuous sex with many different black women and therefore infect them. And a lot of people say the incarceration of black males in prison in the excessive number is one of the reasons why we have excessive rates of uh, women infected with HIV. How can we correct that problem? Well, you're absolutely right that uh, you know we have high levels of African American women HIV infected in the District of Columbia, and most of them are getting it from their husbands, boyfriends who either don't know they're HIV positive themselves or fail to disclose. Uh, the jail problem is an interesting, interesting one. Um, actually, m almost all the all the, the men who come through the prison accept HIV testing. The problem is when they go out, they don't disclose it, and they don't get on medication. Uh, even though the medications, uh, you know, it's, there's a difference between formal access, you know, it's there, but you gotta go and get it. And even with, the, with these navigator programs, some of these guys, you know, are surfing on, on beds, they don't have a place to stay, they don't have a job. HIV's not like really high on their list, they're trying to just get by the next day. So we have a broader problem in society of helping returning citizens get their lives stabilized so they can act responsibly. So it's a, there's a, an act of compassion around HIV and an act of compassion more broadly to try to help brothers who are, have, have had a hard time in life and figure out how to get their lives stabilized. Comprehensive means that you take. Unfortunately, time is up for questions for this session. Um, we have another speaker. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would like to now introduce Vanessa Johnson, JD. She is the principal of Just Cause Counseling. She serves as the board chair for the National Women and AIDS Collective and as a member of the United States People Living with AIDS Caucus. She has 28 years of experience in health and consumer related issues with 14 of those years spent designing innovative and effective HIV prevention and leadership development initiatives. Prior to launching her own business, Ms. Johnson served as the executive vice president of the National Association of People Living with AIDS. She is a graduate of Temple University. Please welcome Ms. Vanessa Johnson. Well, while we're waiting for that, I just wanted to say to Dr. Pappas, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think he set the stage. In a way, it was good you went first, as he talked about case studies and case studies of people living with HIV. Uh, and that really represented the spectrum of people living with HIV AIDS and the impact that stigma has on them, uh, whether that be from the young man who died because he couldn't see his way through the fog of stigma, or to the woman who was willing to accept help and be guided through that fog. So I'm one of those stories, I'm somewhere in between, and I'm gonna share that with you. Okay, we're gonna, talk, we're gonna play a game called the Stigma Game, and why disclosure is difficult but necessary. My name is Vanessa Johnson, and I serve as the board chair for the National Women in AIDS Collective. And I want to thank you for the introduction. Thank you. And I thank my colleagues who are also going to be coming behind me. And I'm going to not share all my slides because I know we're running a little bit behind. So let me just get this on to the slideshow. I changed my slides a little bit. <laughs> this is the version I gave them, and this is my new version. So I don't know if I do both. Okay, so I'm gonna start with, uh, I'm just gonna hold this. I'm gonna put it on the slide that I really want you to pay attention to. And this is, he who conceals his disease cannot expect to be cured. But before I start that, I'm gonna tell you what my presentation basically is gonna outline. Uh, the purpose of the presentation is to share my lifelong struggle with stigma. I'm not going to just talk about HIV-related stigma. I'm going to talk about all the stigmas that probably led to my own vulnerability to HIV infection. I'm going to talk to you about how I faced HIV-related stigma. I had a really nice conversation with uh, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ron Harris is the communication director here. 
at Howard University and for the hospital. And I also want to thank Lisa for uh, having given me the opportunity to present before you this morning because in her invite, it enabled me to look at how I have moved through my own HIV diagnosis and how I've handled stigma. And then I really was really, I, I have come a long way because yesterday I was very comfortable. I did an interview with Dr. Rana and uh, we just played off of each other. That, you know, you have to be very comfortable in your own skin to do that. And I think that's what helps people deal with their own stigma. Because if they can see somebody else who can deal with it on a level where they're like, oh, well, she's talking like it's like everyday conversation, well, maybe I can do that too. Because, you know, I, regardless, there are leaders, but we are also followers. So I lead and follow. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about how I renegotiated my own life after being diagnosed with HIV. I was gonna get into a lot of definitions, but I know the opening panel did that, so I won't. Only thing I will talk, say to you is that I liked the definition I found, which is social stigma is deeply discrediting and may elicit some form of community sanction. And what that reminded me of was the movie Philadelphia. How many people have seen Philadelphia? And in the dialogue, and uh, NAPWA, Steve Bayless and them use this during their present um, training on assumptions, but uh, there's a scene in the movie where they're in the library, and he, Tom Hanks is reading, or Denzel Washington's reading a, a Supreme Court decision about AIDS and discrimination, and there's a line that always touches me, that there's a social death that precedes the actual physical death when, uh, for a person living with HIV. Now, in the, that was done in the early part of the epidemic, but as you can see from the slides that Dr. Pappas presented, that is still true for a lot of people today. So, I'm gonna talk to you about my story, and I'll come back to this. I have, uh, was one of those people on the opposite side of the spectrum. You have one side of the spectrum of people who will never say they're HIV positive, will never disclose, and then you have the other side. And I've always been a person of extremes. I've never been moderate in anything I do. So I always told people from the time I was diagnosed. I mean, I would talk to people in the airport and they'd say, well, what do you do? I'm just coming back from an HIV AIDS conference. And people would be like, why are you telling people that? I'm like, because I want to know where they stand. You know, and sometimes people would move, and sometimes people would be like, well, tell me more about it. Or, and I eventually would, you know, somewhere along the line would say, and you know, by the way, I'm living with it also. I think I just did it as a goof just to see what their reaction would be. You know, I'd be like, I just want to see how I can shock you today. <laughs> so, um, and so I, I would say to, to Mr. Harris, so my issue was never about disclosure. Uh, and I'll tell you why as I go through this. So, I'm going to share with you certain aspects of my life and the challenges I faced, the impact on my well-being, and how I recovered and regained my life. And so, if you have paper and pen, during the course of the story, I want you to guess or ponder how many personal attributes, characteristics, or challenges you hear in my story that might be judged negatively by others and subsequently stigmatizing and ultimately demoralizing to the individual, in this case, me. So I tell a story often for folks who know, have come to some of the trainings I have led about the story of two stories of one girl, me. One that is thriving and one that is, I would characterize as being buried alive. So I start out with the impact of my family history and that my family met the survival needs. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, tells you where you are on that and whether or not you're gonna uh, achieve a self-actualization. Um, there, but there were challenges to meeting those needs. There were safety needs, there was violence in the family, drug use, um, molestation, love and belonging that was very difficult for parents and family members to express. They didn't get it themselves, so you can't, sometimes it's very difficult to give what you don't have. That uh, impacted my esteem. Uh, as I told you, I was a follower and I did whatever I needed to do to belong to somebody. 
so the impact of that was that I felt loved and wanted by my mother, but I uh, also felt a, a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety. Uh, as a child, I uh, faced sexual abuse, and so the research, for those of you who have been following the research, that shows that this experience increases a woman's risk for becoming HIV positive. Also a man's, as men also experience childhood sexual abuse and even uh, intimate partner violence. So as a response to that, and as you can see from the, from the diagram, the little girl's starting to disappear. Remember? There was, there was more of me. And as I get the layers, that's what I wanted to really impress upon you, is that folks start disappearing when they're faced with life challenges and do not and have, don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with that. So we're not even talking about HIV yet. Okay, so first one was why me? With the family history, I'm alone with the molestation and then when I got of age and could get away from the house, I had found that I needed to escape. And as I always say to people, I have several eureka moments. And one of them was when I went to the club and had my first tequila sunrise. That was a eureka moment. Because <laughs> I knew then that was going to do something for me other than how I was feeling at the moment. Uh, so, then came the HIV. I was in my early 30s. And uh, there, for me, my life was over. Because I thought uh, at the age of 27, I started realizing, started trying to do some self-help to overcome some of the challenges I've had in my life and traumas. And then when the HIV came, it was like icing on the cake. So you see, I had disappeared even more. So HIV-related stigma. Uh, can you imagine someone who is diagnosed with HIV and they have to contend with all the layers of that? That's the best visual I could do to give you about how it might feel for people who are living with HIV, who may have dealt with vulnerabilities in their life, and you're now asking them to get a grip and to tell their story. Hello. That's not easy for people because you got to climb out from under all that. So I'm not going to show that slide, but I, I have shown it to you another way. So I showed it to you in pictures, but as you can see where it says vulnerability factors, I talked about that. Genetics, race, gender, human needs, family trauma. The second um, box is risk, risk factors, transmission, acquisition, and then we get to HIV. So people are dealing with a lot of stuff before we get there, dealing with a lot of stigmas. So I'm going to talk to you how stigma looked to me when I first was diagnosed. I like wild animal kingdom shows <laughs> in addition to history. And so the lion is going to be the metaphor that you, how I'm going to use the, as a metaphor for today. So that's how I kind of looked through my life, that something was always chasing me. And at times, it would get closer. And then when I was diagnosed with HIV, I felt like something had pounced on me and I couldn't get it off of me. But that was not the only thing I was dealing with. There was those other things that I was dealing with. Like I just told you, the family history, all that other stuff. And then this all came down all at once. Do you get that? So can you imagine your life has been torn apart? Not by just one thing, but a whole bunch of other things. Because when I got diagnosed with HIV, everything came up all at once. And I think that's why I wouldn't be quiet. I realized at that point that if I didn't speak, I was gonna die. So for other people, they may feel like they're, if they speak, they are going to die. But for me, if I did not speak, I knew I was going to die. I knew I was either going to end up killing somebody or I was going to end up self-destructing even further. So, 
I'm going to just read this one because it's just how I feel about it. I realize that my longevity in terms of years of living with HIV is due to my quest to find my voice, to tell my story, to try to make sense of my own life. I do not want to perish in an overwhelming sea of fear, shame, and guilt that could potentially render me invisible. I strive by the grace of God to continue to find healing. So how did I get uh, up out of that? I had to, this was a uh, renamed renegotiation of my life. I had to renegotiate, not just with myself, but with my family, with my higher power and uh, everyone else. First thing I had to do is I had to get into recovery for all the issues that I was contending with. And the first thing I had to do, like I told you, I was using substances to medicate. So I had to get sober and clean. Now, that all that means something different for me. That might mean something different for you. I have, I don't do illegal drugs anymore, if I can say it like that. But I do have the occasional drink. I have to be clear about that because folks in recovery, when I use recovery, they want you to be clear. So I haven't put away everything, but uh, my recovery, the first 10 years of my living with HIV were completely sober. I had to be because what sanity I had was, was slipping. So I needed to kind of booster that up. I started, like I said, telling my story from the very beginning, but I started not just telling the story about HIV, I started telling the whole story. Then I started thinking about God and my relationship with God and being able to admit to God that I was very angry with him or her. And well, how could you leave me in this position? And as I got through that anger, there were certain things that touched me like uh, the Psalm 23. I love that. I will fear no evil. I figure what more could anybody else do to me? And then I started, we got into mental health. It was myself and my family. My mother, she's very courageous. Uh, she got us uh, into family counseling and that really helped. And I put up this slide because there's stigma attached to getting help. And then after that, I started working a great deal in the field. And one of the things I'm really most proud of is uh, peer-led prevention intervention developed while I was at Napa called Common Threads. Uh, the male counterpart to that is the Bayard Rustin project. And I know that if you see those beautiful pictures out there, that's, that's the Bayard Rustin project. And um, that encompasses more than just the initial combat common threads training, but it's about helping HIV positive peers connect the dots between their life experiences and their HIV status, and hopefully increasing their willingness to disclose their status. I now do yoga, courtesy of Ms. Jackson, who's in the audience. When you have a chance, please talk to her. Dr. Francesca, I call her doctor. She's a doctor. There she is right there. Raise your hand. You know, I'm not the most physical person in the world, but the breathing exercises have been really helpful. So if there's people in your life living with HIV, have them get together with somebody who's involved in yoga. Wait, this, the battery, something wrong here. I, I'm gonna be finished in a minute, but. <laughs> Let's see, okay. Wait, so I didn't want to end with that. I have one more minute. Give me one minute. So what can we do? I was, uh, the ending I had changed a little bit. How many know about The Road Less Traveled, the book that was a really famous self-help book? Yes, and he starts out with life is difficult. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that till I was 30. I wish some, I knew life was difficult because most of my life had been difficult, but I always thought there was an unfairness in the fact that life was undifficult. I thought my life was more undifficult than everybody else's life. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> was difficult, I should say. And so, I, you, know, when I, you know, I tell my son that today too, I said, sometimes life is challenging, that's what I say. There are good things and there are bad things that are going to happen to you. And so I bring that up because when we talk about stigma and people living with HIV AIDS, most of the time the emphasis is, insurance is placed on that individual. 
You know, they have to overcome the stigma. And I want to challenge you all today to think about it from a different perspective because stigma is based on a belief that somehow somebody is different than you or me. And that somehow it is a self-infliction that is uh, deserved. And I want to challenge you to say that it's our response, it is our collective charge to do something about stigma. So let's turn it around on its head. I, I did something with stigma, just a word, S-T-I-M-G-A. So for stigma, I said the S is spiteful. You know, there are some people who go around and tell your status just because they think they can or they want to hurt you. I'm saying maybe the S should be about helping people get self-awareness. I did, before I got diagnosed with HIV, I realized I had certain biases of myself and certain prejudices of myself. When I got diagnosed, I realized that some of that shame was based on my own response to other people before me who had been diagnosed. I didn't say, but here, go I for the grace of God, or however that phrase is. I didn't come out with compassion and understanding to people who were inflicted before I was. I was, thank God it's not me. So I had to face that and, and, and seek uh, forgiveness and redemption. So the other T is tyrannical, where the government may engage in policies, we talked about that, uh, like criminalization or uh, the travel policies. Instead, the T should be teachable. So what I challenge you all is to take that STI, GMA, and come up with your own set of positive and negative. What's the negative and what's the positive? And when people start acting in a manner that is stigmatizing, challenge them on it and go through that exercise with them. That's what I gotta say. Thank you, because my time is up, so I don't have any other. Um, we are now gonna open up some time for a couple of questions for Ms. Johnson. Um, so if you do have questions as we did before, if you could stand uh, at the mic there, and then she will take your questions. All right, well, I have a question for you, Ms. Johnson. Um, how do you encourage people to take their power back, to let them know what the benefits are of sharing one status? Um, how to, pe how to help people reclaim their power. I, I think it's a lot of love and understanding. I, and most people are not gonna... The women that I have worked with, it was creating a safe space and letting them know that no matter what, you are loved in this room. Because folks, at the, at the, at the very least, want to be loved, at the very most want to be loved. So no, if they come in a space where they're accepted and no matter, everything is safe here, you can do what you need to do, then that enables people to make the decision. Because there's nothing that I do that helps anybody reclaim power other than to provide information and guidance. What I try to do is provide a safe place where people can make the decision whether or not they want that. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. I think you have a question from the back of the room. Yes, good morning, Ms. Johnson. Hi, good morning. I'm Omar Abdul Malik. I am a clinician. And I've worked with uh, people living with HIV AIDS for more than 10 years now. The, what happens is invariably, I have a client who wants to disclose to their family member or a significant other, but they don't know how to do it. I still, even after more than 10 years, I don't really know what to tell them. Uh, is there some advice you can give me? Uh, do we, during the training I do, we use a family tree. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to think about this. Mm -hmm. We take it, like I said, sometimes helping families, is we got to help families talk to one another. And one way is a family tree. And just say, identifying everybody that's in the family and then helping them identify the accomplishments and the challenges. I, I, we gotta crack that door first and then maybe the discussion might happen on other issues like HIV. You know, that might help them find their way on how am I gonna tell my family members that this is what I'm dealing with. Okay. Right. So we invite you, I don't know where Steve is. Steve, hold your hand up. 
I talked to Steve and, and, and Lisa Tin, one of the trainees. You can come in as an observer, I believe. Steve, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, I know. But you can, uh, and just see how they do it. Because it really, by giving people tools to be able to talk to their family, it's, it's a much, it's an easier process. It's not gonna make it uh, less difficult, but it's an easier process. Thank you. I had one gentleman who did disclose to his family. His family uh, responded by having a separate set of dishes for mm -hmm. him and a separate set of bed sheets and would no longer let him touch his uh, nieces and nephews. So I always have to mm -hmm. uh, see. You know, yeah. that, that uh, I'm not making light of disclosure at all. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It can go, I mean, we actually let people, I try to inform people that your disclosure can go either way. And are you prepared for either way that it might go? In the trainings that we do, we ask people, are you connected to support groups? Are you connected to somebody you can talk to? One of the things I realized when I told my mother that I was HIV positive is that her reaction was physical. She actually had to go to the hospital. They thought she was having a heart attack. What I realize now is I did a great disservice to her by not explaining HIV before disclosing. Like, do you know anything about HIV? Okay, gotcha, and stuff like that. But we have to tell people when they disclose that it can go either way. And there might be some people in the family that will be accepting and some people that are not. And, and um, you know, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Than I, that person is very courageous. And I hope that they're able to, to work their family through that whole process. Thank you. You're welcome. We have time for one more question. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, well, my name is Akbar Broadway. I'm a, a fourth year psychiatry resident here at Howard. Um, my question to you was, uh, due to stigma, anyone um, concealing their uh, diagnosis after they find out is a personal choice and a hard choice. For you, who was the first person you told? How long did it take you? And what inner strength allowed you to tell this person? I know, wow. Um, first, I wanna just thank you for being in the profession. And when you put up your shingle, let me know. Uh, it was my mother. So I was told by the counselor that day, it was the longest ride home. I couldn't hear or I could see, but I couldn't hear anything. You know, certain senses shut down, depending on how people react to bad news. And so I told her that afternoon, that same afternoon. I knew that, I said to you, said to before, I knew that if I didn't say it, I was gonna die. There, there was no way I could have kept that to myself. And that's where I found the strength because I think it was a survival instinct kicked in. For me, it was survival. I knew I wanted to live, I just didn't know how to live. So I needed help. And I think that was my first cry for help. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. I would now like to introduce Ms. Ann Stengel, PhD. She is a behavioral scientist and stigma specialist at the International Center for Research on Women. She has been actively engaged in the development of HIV stigma measures, stigma reduction tools, and the evaluation of stigma reduction interventions in community and hospital settings in both Tanzania and Vietnam. She has contributed steps to scaling up the global response to stigma and discrimination, including the development of standardized programmatic and global level indicators of measuring stigma discrimination. She is the Secretariat Director of the Stigma Action Network, a global network of researchers, implementers, advocates, HIV affected populations, and development partners. She holds a PhD in public health from Tulane University. Please welcome Ms. Ann Stangle. So um, I'd first just like to thank Dr. Rana and his colleagues for inviting me here to speak today with this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to be participating in this event and to see it happen here in, in DC. I do a lot of my work interna internationally and as other people um, 
mentioned earlier today, that when we often hear of stigma and discrimination, we think of it sort of from that global, from that international perspective. Oh, it's happening in other places. People are dealing with it in other places. So it's really great to see the focus on it here in Washington, D.C. and the U.S. So I'm going to be talking to you uh, this morning uh, to give you a little bit of a global perspective about HIV stigma and to discuss what we need to be able to take stigma reduction interventions to scale. So um, perhaps the best place for us to begin is really asking the question, why? Why should people and the, and the world be investing in stigma and discrimination reduction? We would really hope that the, the right to human dignity and um, the right to live a life free of discrimination would be enough. But unfortunately, that really hasn't been the case um, thus far with the HIV epidemic. However, um, there is good news, uh, which is that we now have the evidence we need to inspire action. And that's what I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit today. Um, so firstly, there's a wealth of data um, indicating that stigma is a key barrier to the uptake of HIV prevention services, including voluntary counseling and testing. Um, stigma is also a big barrier um, for accessing care and support, which a lot of other speakers have uh, are already um, spoken about today. Um, and the uptake of prevention of mother to child transmission services and antiretroviral therapy. Stigma is also a key cause of new HIV infections. There was a recent modeling study that was done um, that indicated that one third to one half of all vertical transmissions from mothers um, to, to their children can be directly attributed to stigma regardless of HIV pre prevalence. Um, so I think we can all agree that stigma is, is a huge problem. Um, there's also a growing global consensus that now is really the time to act and that reducing stigma and discrimination is really a true game changer in the fight against HIV. Um, and this quote uh, from Paul DeLay uh, from UNAIDS, um, I, I, I think is particularly encouraging, so I wanted to share it with you today. He said, everyone in the AIDS response is looking for the game changer that will radically improve our impact. Most of the focus has been on biomedical breakthroughs like a vaccine, a cure, an effective microbicide, using treatment as prevention. We do need all of these, but the true game changer is reducing, uh, is reducing stigma. So this growing global consensus really comes at an opportune time, um, for we now know how to intervene to reduce stigma and discrimination. Dozens of promising interventions uh, have been piloted in a wide range of contexts and are really primed for scale up. We also know that stigma reduction works. A growing body of research demonstrates that interventions can reduce the underlying drivers of stigma and improve attitudes in a very short period of time. Um, we also have the tools for understanding and challenging stigma towards people living with HIV. And these tools have been successfully used with a wide range of audiences, ranging from healthcare workers in Nepal, to communist party leaders in Vietnam, to religious leaders in Afghanistan. And they're available in multiple languages. Um, these tools have also been adapted to address some of the stigmas um, that are directed towards other key populations that are often vulnerable to HIV infection, such as injecting drug users and sex workers. And these are the stigmas that really intersect with one another and make it very difficult, um, as, as Rebecca was pointing out. Oops. Sorry, I was pointing out um, earlier. Um, so these tools are available um, and are freely available for adaptation and, and use. So with all of this, why aren't stigma reduction interventions being taken to scale um, at the pace needed to really impact the, the epidemic? We have all of these great um, examples, um, but they're, they're, they're not at the scale where really we can hope to um, can hope to change things. So ICRW and the Mac AIDS Fund convened a meeting of global experts in November of 2008 to discuss just that. Um, from this meeting, uh, a, a number of barriers were identified, and most of them were around misperceptions. So for example, misperceptions that stigma is too complex to address. Um, we know that this isn't true, and we know that there's successful ways to address it. Misperceptions that stigma reduction is really costly. Um, this is also not the case. And misperceptions about um, stigma being very, uh, stigma reduction efforts being very difficult to um, 
to evaluate. So in order to tackle these barriers and to enable scale up, uh, this group uh, prioritized six action items um, that they felt really needed to happen in order to sort of allow us to break through these barriers and really um, achieve the scale up that we need. Um, so there, these six things were the creation of a global knowledge network on HIV stigma reduction, um, designing and implementing a global communication strategy, developing a compendium of what works to reduce stigma discrimination, consolidating existing measures and measurement tools, initiating a coordinated advocacy campaign to add ending discrimination as a fourth pillar um, to the global response uh, to, to, to HIV. Um, and lastly, to, co to facilitate better coordination among donors. Um, now, I'm happy to report um, that there's been a lot of good progress made since this meeting in 2008. For example, uh, due to some of these targeted advocacy efforts, uh, UNAIDS Executive Director Michelle Sidibe uh, included non-discrimination among his top priorities for ensuring universal access to prevention, care, and treatment. In addition, there's a global working group that's currently working um, to look across all of the hundreds of measures that are out there um, that people are using to, to measure stigma to really come up with some standardized measures across populations of people living with HIV, across for the general public and among healthcare providers. And this will be really important because once we have these kinds of measures that people have access to and know how to use, we'll be able to collect the kind of data and generate the kind of evidence we need to really make the case for why it's really critical that we address this and that we can actually do something to um, reduce stigma. So, um, oh, and the last thing, which I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of the presentation, is the establishment of a global knowledge sharing network. Um, and this network is called the Stigma Action Network, and it was launched in 2010. Um, and then I'm going to be talking to you in a bit more detail about that in the next few slides. So why a network? Um, the consensus among the um, participants in this meeting was that many groups are working in isolation um, and that we could really be much more efficient at scaling up interventions uh, if people had an opportunity to share and learn from one another, to speak with a collective voice, to raise external awareness about best practices, um, and to really coordinate efforts for efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, the network was also seen as a way to enhance communication um, within and across uh, sectors which was really lacking. Um, and this was, a, this was identified as a key problem. And lastly, um, the, the people at this meeting felt that it would really be great to have a central repository for uh, the latest information that's available about reducing stigma and discrimination, including advocacy materials, research, that network members in the general um, public could really contribute to, um, could upload their own resources, could see what's available, and could really have access to all of the latest tools. This is a big gap. That a lot of the literature around stigma is published in the gray literature. It's not in peer-reviewed journals. And so a lot of times that makes it difficult for people to find what they need and to realize that there are actually really good examples of programs that have been able to reduce stigma, and all they have to do is adapt it to their context. Okay. I also just want to point out um, that this entire process to design, launch, and implement the Stigma Action Network has been a collective one. Um, it's involved numerous organizations, including networks of people living with HIV and other key populations, academic institutions, NGOs, advocates, and donors. And this level of collaboration has really been critical and we'll, it, we hope will ensure that the SAN is able to meet uh, the differing needs of each of these uh, key stakeholder groups moving forward. Uh, just quickly, I want to share with you the mission of the SAN, which is to reduce HIV-related stigma and discrimination through a dynamic network that will catalyze action and commitment locally, regionally, and globally through knowledge, sharing, dialogue, and partnerships. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of an update on where we are now. So in the first year of operations, uh, we established the governing and operational structure. Um, ICRW is serving as the first technical secretariat for the Stigma Action Network. Um, and we have six organizations that are currently um, uh, participating in a volunteer steering committee. And the organizations are listed here. The, uh, the network was launched at the IAS meeting in Vienna in July of 2010. The website, uh, which is up and running, 
funding now uh, was launched in May. Um, and we've secured funding for a second year of operations, which, which is very good. We're very excited about that. And now we're really working on ways to expand the reach and impact of the SAN. So for example, we're in the process of updating the website to add country pages so that people um, from various countries around the world can go and find data on stigma and discrimination, find advocacy tools, um, talk with other people working on the topic in, the, in their country. Um, and we're also working to develop a newsletter which uh, will be coming out shortly and to, to enhance the blog. So I just want to talk quickly about the website. Um, this is a really, really great resource and I hope you'll all go and, and take a look at it. Um, it was really developed um, based on the two main needs that were identified during the sort of background research planning phase leading up to the network, which is that there was really a need um, to have this repository and to allow people to access and share information. Um, and there was also this need to foster global networking across sectors. Um, so researchers often talk amongst themselves, networks of living, people living with HIV often talk, talk amongst themselves, but that, that really that cross collaboration that's so critical for this effort is, wasn't really happening at the level that um and that's needed around HIV stigma specifically. Um, so the website is really hoping to help um, to sort of foster that. Um, so I also just want to mention that the e-library on the website currently has over 600 resources um, that are publicly available. Anyone can access in this information and we certainly hope you will all check it out. Um, we've had a, a pretty a decent amount of visits to the site, over 2,100 visitors from 109 uh, countries. So how can you participate? Um, firstly, we hope that you'll join the SAN. Uh, you can log go to the website and you can sign up to be a member. You can also sign up for the e-forum and to receive the e-newsletter. Um, currently, we're seeking to expand our steering committee. We had a very, we still have a very shoestring budget, but we, we really want to um, expand the, uh, the steering committee and set up an advisory committee. So those are some things that we're doing right now. And if you're interested in participating, you can check out the website and you can find information on how to apply. Um, we also would really encourage everyone to upload resources, events, news, share your personal stories, um, add a blog post, um, let us know if you have something that you'd like us to feature as a hot topic. Um, all of those uh, things would be extremely helpful. And lastly, really just to spread the word. Um, please share, share this information with your friends, with your colleagues, um, and let us know if you have any questions or how we can um, you know, do a better job of getting you the information that you need. So I'd like to end with this slide, which is kind of a fun, fun slide, and I'll show you why. Which basically, the point here is to suggest that by investing in stigma reduction, it really has this ripple effect that's going to impact across all HIV and AIDS programming. Um, by, by helping to reduce stigma, we're going to see in improvements in care and in people accessing care and support, in people accessing prevention, and in people accessing treatment. And all of these are, are really critical. I'd also just like to say that, um, you know, this is, as someone said earlier, this is the 30, this year marks the 30th year um, from when um, HIV and AIDS were first reported. Um, and we really can't continue to maintain the status quo in terms of our response um, to H, in terms of our global response to HIV. Um, it's really time for the global community to move from rhetoric to action by fully integrating stigma and discrimination reduction into prevention, care, and treatment efforts and investing the resources necessary to take stigma reduction to scale globally. We know that achieving universal access and getting to zero is really dependent on our ability to reduce stigma discrimination globally. We hope that the Stigma Action Network is one way in which we can spur this kind of action and we really hope that you'll all participate um, and look forward to working with you all on this exciting endeavor. So thank you for your time and thank you to all the panelists and the conference organizers. Thanks very much. We will now open this time up for some questions for Anne. If you have questions, please line up at this mic. And I will begin, as usual. <laughs> um, 
how should we talk about HIV in this country and in other countries that encourages people to know their status without creating a stigma or without promoting a sense of apathy? Thank you. I think, um, gosh, one of the key things is really that uh, we, we need to, we ha well, firstly, you have to have these safe spaces, I think, to allow people who, who are um, affected by HIV to sort of um, you know, be able to, 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 to cope with that diagnosis and then to also be supported to disclose. But I also think in addition to that, oftentimes um, we, sort of ex we sort of assume that stigma reduction interventions are really only targeted towards people living with HIV, which is really a, a fallacy. That's, that's not a good way to approach it at all. And we really need a multifaceted approach. We need programs that are addressing sort of the stigmatizers as well as the people who are stigmatized. Um, and that, that's why uh, programs that have been successful in other countries have actually worked at multiple levels. So you're engaging, you know, the senior policy people and people in the government. Um, you're working through, you know, national and local ministries of health. Um, you're working with community leaders. Um, and, and schools, and you're sort of touching upon all the key stakeholders where people are going to be um, experiencing stigma and where they're going to need support. So if you can really help to ensure that the people that are going to be the support structure or support system for people, uh, if we can help them to improve their attitudes and to see that stigma is not a good thing and that it really is promoting the epidemic and it's certainly um, decreasing the quality of life of people living with HIV, that that is really critical. So I think, you know, it, sometimes it's a little bit difficult and daunting to think of how can you change the attitudes of an entire nation or an entire community, but it's certainly possible to do. And I think you just really need to get as many people on board as possible. Um, and then I have one last question. Um, being that you have been on the national scene here in the U.S. and then the global scene as well, I'm sure that you've seen firsthand what the criminalization of HIV can do. Um, what is your charge, I guess, to other people so that there, we don't create a barrier um, when it comes to accessing care? Yeah, I think criminalization is a huge issue. Um, and there are a lot of great groups, including the Global Network of People Living with HIV, um, who are really dedicated right now to bringing this issue of criminalization to the forefront and making sure that, um, you know, that are help, or hopefully helping countries who have made these decisions and made these laws to, to retract them. Because it's, it's certainly, if nothing else, only going to enforce stigma further. And we've made such progress globally that these kinds of laws coming into place in the last few years are, are really, it's really an impediment and hopefully through these global efforts um, and the Stigma Action Network is certainly supportive of these efforts. Um, we can, I, I, and I guess the only thing is really advocacy. I mean, continuing to advocate that these types of criminalization uh, um, policies are, are, are really not the way we should be, should be headed. Thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Mr. Callie Lindsay. He is the Director of Government Affairs and Communication at the National Minority AIDS Council. He previously held positions at the Harlem United Community AIDS Center, where he championed routine HIV screening and comprehensive health care for people suffering from multiple chronic comorbid, 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 sorry, conditions at Porter Novelli, where he developed a social marketing prevention campaign targeting young black, gay, and bisexual men and as the VP of Federal Government Affairs at the National Association of People Living with AIDS. He co-convened AIDS Watch 2008 and 2009. He began his HIV AIDS career in 2003 as an HIV counselor shortly after learning his own HIV diagnosis. Please welcome Mr. Kelly Lindsay. Thank you, Caressa, for that warm introduction. Um, good morning to all those that are visiting with us, both in the room and throughout the country and the world. Um, thank you again to Dr. Rana and the other conference organizers for inviting me to speak with you today and for organizing such a wonderful event. And thank you to all of you who have stuck in the room and not answered your calls on your cell phones or not been pulled away by email to take advantage of other businesses that have stayed to listen to me. Um, I'm going to put some slides up here. I originally wasn't planning to do any slides because I much prefer to just have a conversation and actually talk from slides. But I thought that you folks might get tired of seeing my ugly mug, so I'm going to give you something else to look at. 
So what I want to talk to you all about today, or what I was actually asked to talk about today, was really the role of uh, stigma as it pertains to men who have sex with men. So I'm going to stop right there and just talk about the term men who have sex with men. And if we just stop and think about what that language communicates, number one, it's a, it's a term that was developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it was largely used to categorize a group of individuals who didn't necessarily want to disclose their sexual identity because they were concerned with the very topic that we're here to talk about today, stigma. So if we even think about the individuals that are highly impacted by HIV today and the individuals who remain overwhelmingly um, at risk for uh, transmitting and acquiring the disease, we first have to think about how they experience their everyday lives. If we're talking about individuals that aren't yet at a position where they're in a place that they can accept and articulate their own sexual identity, think about their ability to really accept the reality of their sexual risk. Think about their ability to self-actualize. Vanessa Johnson did a great job of talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-actualization is something that not only comes from an individual's ability to manage their economic environment, but also their emotional, mental, and psychological environment. And if we can't even have conversations about homosexuality or being gay or being bisexual, and we have to find a safe zone under the guise of a, of a term called men who have sex with men. Number one, you're reducing me to something that only, below, only exists below my waist, and you're forgetting about all the rest of me. And secondly, you're not even truly seeing the person that stands in front of you. So I'm going to talk today about gay and bisexual men. I'm going to do away with the term men who have sex with men, and I hope that you all will join me for the journey. I want to start by just kind of looking at the numbers. You may already know that gay men and other men who have sex with men account for 61% of all new infections that occur in the United States. We talked about the beginning of this epidemic. It started 30 years ago under the name gay-related immune deficiency. When the disease started, it stigmatized the gay community and that stigma has never left. It exists, it's pervasive, it exists before gay and bisexual men become HIV positive, and it exists afterwards. According to the CDC, gay men are at least 44 times as likely to be diagnosed with HIV than other men, and 40 times as likely to be infected with HIV as women. Now this is irrespective of the fact that gay men make up 2 to 3% of the 315 million people that live in the United States of America. HIV is a very severe and persistent issue that prevails in the gay community that we struggle with for 30 years and we continue to struggle with today, even in spite of all the research advancement and opportunities. The National HIV AIDS Strategy spoke to it clearly, but we're going to need a lot of community mobilization in order to realize any of the goals articulated in that document. Recently, the CDC released new HIV surveillance data, which articulated that we have a really serious problem amongst our young gay men. Gay youth aged 13 to 29 accounted for 27% of all new infections, but among young gay men of color, this trend is even more pronounced. Between 2006 and 2009, HIV infections among young black gay men spiked by 48%. 48%. If you look at the increases in HIV infections among MSM, many CDC epidemiologists will tell you that the reason that infections are rising amongst MSM is not because they're rising and other populations is particularly because they're rising among young, black, and Hispanic gay men. And what that means is that the number of infections among white MSM have pretty much stabilized, but at the same time, while that stabilized, the infection rates among the younger black gay men have continued to grow, which means that we're not doing our jobs correctly. There are individuals that are young and growing in a world where we already know how to prevent HIV, that are not getting the message, not being reached, and not getting into the care and treatment that they need. So we need to do a better job. A recent CDC analysis of 21 urban areas found that among black immigrants of age 25 to 29, 30% were HIV positive. Oops. And 72% were unaware that they were infected. 72% had HIV and didn't know that they had it. How are we ever supposed to reduce HIV infections among gay men 
if we can't even get them to get the test. We talked a little bit earlier, I'm gonna stop here and talk a little bit earlier about how we talk about the epidemiology. It's important that we know the numbers, but it's also important for us to realize that these numbers and the way that we articulate them have an impact. We can talk about the overwhelming impact that HIV has had among gay and bisexual men, but we also have to realize how that stigmatizes gay men. When you say that over half of uh, black gay men in five cities throughout the country were found to be HIV positive, that makes them really undesirable sexual partners, really undesirable relationship partners, and really undesirable people to invite to your dinner party. So when we think about how we articulate the numbers and how we address the epidemic, we also have to think about the language that we use, how we talk about the numbers and the epi, and we have to think about the people that, that are behind the numbers at the end of the day. And we have to find new ways to communicate our messages that bring people into the services that goes after that 72%, but doesn't further stigmatize communities, individuals, and drive them further away from care. 2011 and 2010 have been hard years. We know that many young gay men have decided that life was too tough, that either due to technology or due to words or sentiments that were expressed by people that were in their families, people that were in their schools, people that were in their communities, they decided to take their own life. These young individuals never got a chance to self-actualize, if you would, because these people never made it to the age of 21. These aren't college-aged individuals. These are young, high school, junior high-aged individuals who decided that the amount of stigma that they, that they experienced on a day-to-day -day basis was just too much to bear, and they took their own life. Imagine adding HIV on top of that. Caressa brought up HIV criminalization laws. It's important for us to really think about what HIV criminalization laws communicate. First of all, none of them require transmission to occur. So the fact that they are articulated as something that's supposed to protect the general population from transmission of HIV is absolutely flawed and ridiculous. The existence of HIV criminalization laws was intended to target and single out HIV positive people and make them responsible for the health of everybody around them. My mother always told me it takes two to make a decision. So placing all of the responsibility and the accountability on an HIV positive person to protect the health of another person is egregious. And I wish Mayor Ford was still here because we need the World Conference of Mayors to stand up and take on this charge. They need to absolutely step forward and say that any person that is singled out because of the affliction that they're trying to overcome is a, tra is a tragedy to justice everywhere in the world. And if Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was still with us today, I believe that would be his message. But if we just think about some of the impacts of the HIV criminalization laws that have occurred recently, you'll see that people have been criminalized for things that have ultimately not even resulted in any kind of public health impact. Individuals have been criminalized for spitting, biting, using other bodily fluids that don't transmit HIV, or sometimes having protected sex. And we all know that condoms are 99% effective and that they are an effective means of preventing HIV transmission, but individuals are still receiving anywhere up to multiple decades of prison sentences just because they engaged in some activity and they were HIV positive. It cannot go on. So how do we fight back? Caressa mentioned in my bio when she was opening up that um, I had the privilege of working on a social marketing campaign which has recently been released. It was actually released a couple of days ago by the Center for Disease Control. It's called Testing Makes Us Stronger. It's an important campaign that I hope gets as viral as possible because not only do we need to encourage those 72% of people who remain unaware to get tested, but this is the first campaign that's been funded by the U.S. government that uses images of black gay men that you see in the everyday community. These aren't stock photos. Dwayne Kramer actually went out into the community and took uh, photos of actual gay men, some of them living with HIV, some of them not, and put them into a national campaign so people could see themselves on these posters. You can see that there are people that are overcoming the situation 
and can be motivated into action. And it's important that we not only champion this and make it as viral as possible, we need to encourage the government to do more of this. I want to see a campaign like this for our African American women, for Latino women, for Hispanic gay men, for white gay men. I want to see it for every population out there that really remains heavily impacted by HIV. It's time for us to look at ourselves so that we can become the change it is that we seek. And we have to give credit to the It Gets Better campaign. I think that that was probably one of the most tremendous responses to all of the suicides that were occurring over the past couple of years. And it's something that we need to figure out how to use effectively in our own efforts as well. It not only gets better once you uh, disclose or come to terms with your sexual identity, it also gets a lot better once you come to terms with your HIV positive uh, reality. Once you get tested, once you get into care and treatment, once you start talking to people that you love, everything gets better. I'll get personal just for a second and tell you that for a long time I wasn't open about my HIV status to my parents. In fact, people on the World Wide Web knew about my HIV status before I had had a conversation with my mother and father. But when I decided to leave uh, Detroit, Michigan, where I got my start, and moved to Washington, D.C. in 2006, I decided to have the conversation with them before I left. Um, I was living in Washington, D.C. for four years, and then I uh, got a job to move to Atlanta, Georgia. And the first question that came out of my father's mouth was, what's your access to care going to be like when you get down there? It's just having, it's as simple as having a conversation that removes the binds to that stigma causes. And it's that opportunity that we too often don't give our friends and family members that really creates opportunities for us to educate, empower, and develop support networks that help us understand that it gets better. You acknowledge your HIV status and you talk to people and people will help you on your journey. And then we have to also acknowledge the important work that individuals like Don Lemon and Zachary Quinto and other uh, individuals that are in the public eye have contributed to our efforts by coming out about their uh, same-sex identity. What this means to many individuals is that for all of those young gay men who thought that they were alone, there are other people out there that are going through their same issues that have made it, that have become CNN news anchors on the weekend or um, or whatever, um, I think the movie he was uh, Mr. Spock in, whatever that movie is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm terrible at that stuff. But having just those images for these young gay men to see and, and, and know that there are brighter days ahead, that it does get better and they do have a life to look forward to, that helps to, to perpetuate the message of it gets better and it also makes them more resilient to living without HIV. Finally, um, I think it's okay for me to say this, and if it's not, I don't care. I love this president. I love this president because he has done so much more for people like me than anybody that has come before us. Not only has he articulated the first uh, national HIV AIDS strategy for the United States, which has never been done before, and it's a requirement that we have for other countries. Yeah, clap for that. That's an important advancement. <laughs> but he's also done things like uh, worked very hard to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, a very important message to gay men and lesbians that want to serve openly in the, in the military and fight for their country but don't want to do it in the closet and without respecting their full selves. He's also uh, done things like expand access to hospital visitation rights for gay and lesbian partners. Imagine what it's been like for the past 30 years having a partner suffering and dying in the hospital with HIV and having a hospital administrator tell you you can't go in the room to see them. This is incredible. And we owe it to a president who has decided to take on the leadership and, and do the necessary work to make it happen. And we've done a lot of work on the state and local level in uh, advancing opportunities for same-sex relationships. Washington, D.C., congratulations. You all made history by being one of the first cities out there to expand access. It's incredible, and you deserve a lot of credit. New York followed in suit. We thought we would beat you. I was in New York at the time. Um, I, we didn't beat you, but nonetheless, the job is done, and it's important for us to recognize that we can't encourage uh, HIV prevention behaviors that are rooted in healthy relationships if 
we discredit and, and invalidate the very relationships that we're telling people that they need to look forward to. And finally, um, um, that was my last slide. I told you I didn't want to give you all a lot of slides. I just wanted to end on a note, um, really kind of giving the National HIV AIDS strategy credit for what it has accomplished. In the strategy, he articulates that the vision is for the United States to become a world where HIV infections are rare. And when they do occur, and when they do occur that individuals will have unfettered access to high quality health care and treatment regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, or disability status. When we accomplish that vision, I'm sure that I'll be looking out at the same faces that I'm seeing today, and I'll be able to say job well done. I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. We would now like to open up this time for questions for Mr. Kali. You can stand in this mic. Oh, there's someone coming already. Again, uh, my name is Akra Broe, fourth year psychiatry resident here at Howard. Um, what you talked about um, today, I think is important. And uh, I want you to um, uh, answer a question for me. Uh, particularly in your case, or the case of many others, uh, many other males uh, or females in your situation as dealing with the stigma of um, their sexual orientation. And then on top of that, to have this diagnosis, um, how much more impactful is the prior stigma in addition to this new stigma that's causing them to be less likely to act or less likely to tell others about their, uh, about their diagnosis, even their loved ones. People may have been struggling to do, um, to come out of the closet for years to their loved ones and they finally did or they never did and now they have this on top of it. How impactful is that prior stigma to this new one that's causing this. I think this needs to be addressed or it, it needs to be understood first. Um, could you elaborate on that? Okay, we're on now. Uh, thank you for your question. I think that there's a lot of things that we can do. The first thing that we need to do, I'll give you three things. Um, the first thing that we need to do is take a zero tolerance approach on gay related stigma in our communities. I mean, one of the mistakes that we make a lot of times in the HIV community is we act like there's these, this one pocket of individuals that can solve all the problems of the world, particularly right now we're looking towards uh, African American churches to really kind of solve and really mobilize the community to do something about HIV. Well, let's recognize that black churches have done a lot of trauma and damage among black, lesbian, and gay people throughout the country, world over, and continue to do it around the globe. So we can't expect the people that are doing us harm to save our lives. And we certainly can't expect to do it when we're sitting in the, in the congregation and continuing to tithe and not speaking our truth. And it's time for not only gay men, but also our heterosexual colleagues and loved ones to take a stand and say, I'm not having it anymore. In 2006, when I first arrived at Washington, D.C., I arrived in February, and, and in June, uh, when Father's uh, Day came around, Bishop Alfred Owens at Mount Calvary Church, and I hope he listens to this message because he needs to hear this, articulated a message from the pulpit that said, today I'm talking to the real men. And I'm not talking to you sissies. I'm talking to only the real men. I want the real men to stand up and come to the front of the church. Regardless of the fact that the only reason that he has a congregation is because one of those sissies that he was talking about is directed his choir. He still felt it comfortable enough to go and decry individuals that were of a particular sexual identity because he felt that they weren't masculine enough. Now let's talk about the definition of masculinity. We need to do something about that in the black community. You're not a man if you wear Tim's and you're a thug. I will challenge many of the men that I meet on a day-to-day -day basis to outman me because I pay my bills every day. I graduated from college. I help people out in my, in my community and I'm there for my mother, my sister, and my niece. And guess what? I pay her bills when her father won't. So if you want to tell me about how much of a man I am, you step up to the plate and take my, take my place.
And then finally, I would just say that if we wanted to talk about the various stigmas, we have to first deal with a lot of the stigmas that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Many of uh, the black gay men that we're working with on a, uh, on a regular basis are anesthetized. Because of all of the trauma and the stuff that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, those people that I showed you pictures of that have committed suicide, most of them are walking around numb and stunned because they're using substances, they're using sex, and they're using all kinds of alternative means to deal with their reality. If we don't, under, uh, if we don't address the underlying causes of HIV vulnerability in the community, we're never going to be able to win this fight. One, one more thing. I think you are absolutely right here in what you just said. Um, for me, um, a friend of mine is actually in this situation, and he came out to me, and I see him like doing reckless things with his life and I know that's why mm -hmm. you know what I mean and all I could do is support him but I know that's why but he won't get the help that he needs keep talking to him and if he stops listening tell him to call me all right all right thanks bro we have one final question yeah I got um this is my second time coming to the World AIDS. First of all, I've been positive for 25 years. Um, how do you reach out to people who live in the woods? I'm having a really hard time here. Can you repeat that? How do you reach out to people who choose to live in the woods because, of the, because they're positive? Okay. We're not open about living with HIV. Um, I think that uh, Vanessa really kind of presented the best model for that. I think it's about telling your story. I, I, I congratulate you, brother, not only for overcoming the journey, but also for being courageous enough to stand in front of that mic and talk about your truth. I think what we have to do is continue to tell our story loudly and boldly. Many of my friends and uh, fellow colleagues, many of the people that I work with in this very field come up to me on a regular basis and ask me why I disclose my HIV positive identity. And I tell them and I have to remind them that it ain't for you. It's for all the other people in the room that are HIV positive that don't feel the strength to say anything about it. And it's because I'm not ashamed of my journey, but I'm telling other people about my journey so that they can make different decisions and, and get on a better path for themselves. I think you're doing the right thing, brother, and the, the more you continue to talk about it to people both in this room and outside this room, I think you'll make the impact that you, that you seek. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we close this session and we break for lunch, I first want to thank you all so much for sharing your time and for sharing your stories with us. Um, but this is my second year being here, and last year on my way out of the door, I was chased down by a crazy person, and he tapped me on the shoulder, this, this crazy person, and he said, hey, do you want to do a video with me about stigma? And I'm like, okay, sure. He's like, I heard you sing, and I heard you really good, and like he like knew my bio and my shoe size and all this stuff. And so I was a little freak out, but I was like, okay. So he contacted me, um, and we sat down and we talked about the vision of what he wanted this video to be and the uses that he would want this video to have far and beyond um, just this conference. And so this is the culmination of our hard work, what you're about to see. Um, he lined me up with an all-star cast of singers and dancers and musicians, um, and we were able to put together this video. So I hope that you enjoy it, um, and you all have a wonderful afternoon. You're here too. 
ya Levántate y sale al mundo a luchar ¡Sigue! Diles que no es tiempo de irte, tú no has acabado And if you're ready to heal and ready to give, then guess what? You're ready to live.